All right, if everyone could take their seats, we're going to get started. Um, we had a, a public comment session yesterday, but uh, there wasn't any sign-ups, and so we um, put the public comment sign-up sheet out again, and we do have a couple this morning, and I think Dan Falvey is going to be the first up. Thank you. Can you hear me this morning? Can you hear me this morning, sir? Hear you, Dan. Anytime you want to start. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, this morning, I have a uh, a question and a comment, and the question is of Dr. Stewart on the decision tables. Um, and what I'm trying to do is recall when you calculate those probabilities um, out three years, what is the default assumption of what the harvest rate will be in year two and three? For example, if the commission was to choose status quo this year, which is about an F50 rate, um, does that F50 carry forward in year two or three, or does the decision table assume the commission will resume to the full F43 rate in year two and year three? Good morning. Through the chair, I can take that question. So the decision table assumes a constant TCEY for the three-year period. So it may actually correspond to a different level of fishing intensity in each of those forward years, but it just takes the TCEY from 2023 and extends that forward for two more years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that helps a lot. Um, my comment is that I personally have found myself in a bit of a quandary this year in that the best available science, and I believe the SRB and Ian have said it, the right thing to do was to change natural mortality, says we can take up to 52 million pounds, but there is four or five slides of additional risks that should be considered before you make that decision. What we don't have is tools to help us quantify how to incorporate those additional risks into our decision making. It's pretty much whatever feels good. Um, do we take 10% less? Do we take 20% less? Do we take 30% less? And so what I was going to ask the commission is to try and identify a work plan on how to develop a framework that we can, you know, um, and some business rules on how to integrate these additional risks into our decision making in a predictable manner. You know, my time on being part of the MSE has been all about trying to come up with a formula for setting coastwide TCEYs, but this move towards a more transparent risk neutral stock assessment has kind of left us with more ad hoc decision making and i think we need to bridge the the gap there um and i don't really know exactly what some of those tools would be you know um i think the decision table clarification that it, you know the probabilities are based on maintaining a constant tcey for that time period is helpful um i think other tools to help us understand the variability in the survey um, and how that, you know, if we use the FIS as a guide for the intervening things, you know, do we need to develop buffers on that at the coastwide level? I believe the MSC model said you do um, need some coastwide buffers as well to help mitigate things. Um, should we develop business rules that look at the suite of year classes in the water and other factors that there to help us come up with a more formulaic approach in the future? And that was my comment. Thank you. Much, Dan. I don't know if you want to respond to any of that, Ian, or not. No. Okay. Thanks again, Dan, for the for the comments and um, um, ideas about uh, how to move forward. Um, next speaker, Linda Binken. If you could come up to the microphone at the front. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I just want to start by saying thank you for hosting us here in Canada, and particularly Victoria. It's always a pleasure to come here for a meeting. Um, it certainly has reminded me, being back together, how important the stakeholder component is of these meetings. And along with appreciating the time to work with other stakeholders here at the meeting, I just would like to remind the Secretariat and the Commissioners how much value we've achieved over the years from having the 
Ian and other members of the commission come through the communities, meet with fishermen, talk to fishermen about what they're seeing on the water. And I know we all had, we had to stop that during COVID, but just to mention to you how much value we found from that and to urge you to, to start that up again when you feel like it's possible. Um, my, my comment and question, I guess, is a little bit similar to what Dan brought up. And I was thinking more specifically of climate change and how from, and, and maybe this is something that Ian wants to address now or, or later, but um, in thinking about climate change and what we heard yesterday that we can expect more unpredictability and variability from the stock as a result of climate change, sort of from the ecosystem generally, how do we incorporate that information? And suggests that we should not overreact to changes we see from one year to the next? Should we be thinking about smoothers that we apply to the FIS? Should be, we be thinking about ways to bound annual change? Or does it mean we factor in greater levels of precaution as we look at where our TCUIs should be? Um, and I don't know whether that's something that um, Dr. Stewart wants to address now or, or something that you can provide to stakeholders as feedback later. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks very much, Linda. Um, I'm sure that's on a number of people's minds about climate change and potential impacts on uh, the stock um, um, health of uh, halibut, but also other species for sure. So I don't know, Ian, if you had anything you wanted to add at this point. Thank you, through the chair. Just a couple quick comments, maybe. I, I think the first is with regard to what we're doing well which is tracking the distribution of the stock with a comprehensive survey. We're looking at a somewhat reduced design in 2023, but generally our fishery independence set line survey is providing us with a very reliable estimate of the distribution of the stock. And that allows us to keep track of where the fish are and adjust accordingly in the management system. So I think that's something that we're doing quite well. What we learn from other species with climate change is to be prepared for more variability. I think we should be thinking toward expecting more, both more spatial variability and perhaps more variability in productivity. Um, that said, it's not clear that it necessarily requires an additional level of precaution beyond, be, because we are already dealing with variability in size and age and variability in, in recruitment very specifically, I, I'm not sure that it necessarily requires additional precaution beyond that, but certainly keeping an eye on those things. I think getting back to Dan's comment a few minutes ago, we really don't have a quantitative framework to help you turn these types of concerns into quantitative adjustments to the TCEY. And that's, it's a challenge, and I don't think any fisheries really have that sorted out yet, but we're working on it. We are also structuring our five-year and, and even longer-term research program to try and address some of these questions, but we may not have answers right away. Thank you. All right, the uh, next speaker is Duncan Fields. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Duncan Fields. I work with the uh, Old Harbor and Uzinki uh, CQEs, community quota entities that own and lease halibut for their communities. I'm talking about uh, something perhaps a little off topic, but it's something I want the commission to continue to think about and continue to consider, and that is bycatch utilization of halibut. Currently, as we all know, uh, the fishery, the commercial fisheries, mostly in the United States, but also in Canada, uh, throw several million pounds of halibut away, dead halibut, every year. That issue is often confused with the quantity of bycatch. I believe that they're separate issues. I think we all agree we would like to see less bycatch generally. But the issue is then unavoidable bycatch, dead halibut, why should we continue to throw those fish away? I've been asked, why is that important to you, Duncan? Why does it matter? I grew up in rural Alaska, <clears throat> and the people that I grew up with, people I work for now, feel like it's a, it's a moral issue to waste and throw food away. I never cared for Dora Aga's 
halibut head chowder. But she and everybody else in that village would never throw those heads away because of their value on utilization of the species. Yet in the late 70s and early 80s, when our trawl fisheries began developing in the Gulf of Alaska, those folks watched thousands and thousands and thousands and eventually millions of pounds of halibut uh, being wasted. Why would it matter if we changed our view of bycatch utilization? First, I think it's the right thing to do. Second, I think we're going to see increasing pressure from the environmental community relative to certification, marine stewardship councils and others a focus on this issue. Why not the industry step forward? Third, I think there's great economic value to, to be obtained from generally, generally speaking for halibut stakeholders. It's easy to get into a bait of who would receive the revenue, who would benefit. <clears throat> How I envision moving forward is to develop an ethic or develop a policy to reduce or to better utilize halibut and then create some sort of a third party representative body with the IPHC, North Pacific Council, State of Alaska, um, BC, Providence and Canada, and let that entity decide who receives the economic value. Perhaps we can use it for IPHC set line surveys. Perhaps we can use it for better observer coverage in Alaska. Perhaps we can use it to in some way <clears throat> benefit fishermen that take care of their halibut as bycatch. The other advantage is, is we're competing in a world market for uh, protein uh, for the white tablecloth uh, market with our halibut. We have a four month gap every year when there's no fresh halibut available. That's necessary for our regulatory structure. Currently, if the trawl fishery in the Gulf of Alaska, the cod fishery were able to retain halibut, you would have halibut, fresh halibut on the market and available. That would sustain the commercial fishery in the months where not halibut, fresh halibut is not available. I could go on and on, but my point is, the commission needs to focus on bycatch utilization. There's some ambiguity, whether or not within the treaty structure, <clears throat> uh, having fish or halibut caught other than from longline can enter into the stream of commerce. I think that it can, but it would be nice for the commission to clarify that. Then let the respective bodies, <clears throat> the Providence uh, here in BC and the North Pacific Council, uh, the agency in Alaska, begin to make incremental gains on better utilization of halibut. I think we all benefit from that. Thank you for your time this morning. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Duncan. Um, up, up next is Lyle Pierce. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, nice to be back in the room and see all the friendly faces from both sides of the line and work with our colleagues again. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, echoing and agreeing with Linda. It's nice to get us all back and, and it is very important that we have the stakeholders in the room to kind of balance things out as we move forward. And I, I really feel that over the last few years, we've been kind of missing that. But my question is from yesterday on slide 51, and I'm assuming you're not pulling them up. There's some, when I was looking at the variations through the FIS, we had some big variations back in around 2013 when the retrospective bias was figured out. And then it kind of flattened out a bit, nines and eights and tens. And then about 2018, we're seeing some really big changes like plus 26, minus 22, plus 20, things like that. So I was curious, why are we seeing these big fluctuations in the last four years? Is there something that's changed? Because last year, I think, was the biggest one that I ever saw, which was about a 52% up in area 3B. And I've never seen numbers like that come out before. So has something changed that's driving these numbers to be that big? Thanks for the question through the chair. I, I think we've, we've had a constant evolution of an improvement of our stock assessment methods. And some of those changes that we've made over time have corresponded to jumps up either either up or down in these estimates. 
The other thing that's been happening behind the scenes is that we have included increasingly more of the overall picture in our results. So you, you'll recall from the early 2000 and teens that we were still not yet accounting for all sizes of halibut and all sources of mortality. And over time, we have brought in the U26 fish. We've been accounting for um, all, all sizes and sources of mortality. So some of this variability is due to change in methods. And some of it, I think, is due to an improvement in our process in actually accounting for more of the, the variability in the, both the mortality that's associated with the stock, as well as the improvements in the survey as a function of the survey expansion. We're now seeing more of the variability that's actually occurring in the stock, where the, the old survey footprint prior to our expansion that we began well, really in 2011, but, but more focused in 2014, um, only the core areas. I, I'm not sure we were fully capturing all of the variability that was actually going on in the stock prior to that time. So I, in short answer, it's a combination of lots of factors, most of which I think are real. Okay. Um, second question, just as I, uh, Linda kind of touched on it and I was listening to it, it's around climate change. And I mean, I, you can't deny the climate's changing, but I was curious, we set the CCAT on almost every set when we're out there doing the research. Is the CCAT picking up any real differences in the bottom part of the ocean or, you know, as opposed to the top part? Are we seeing change all the way down to the bottom? Through the chair, yes, it, it is. And in fact, we've, we've just recently improved our... Um, the ability to access those data. So you'll find now on our website that you can actually get access to the CCAT data. I know for a long time that there was a long delay and it was quite challenging to get access to that. On our end, we have been tracking that information. And, and one of the things that we we saw, um, and, and it's corroborated from other sources as well, is that, for example, in the Gulf of Alaska, the warm water that occurred beginning in 2014, we were able to track that with, this, with our CCAT data and, again, consistent with what's being seen on other surveys in the area, that that warm water began as a fairly shallow phenomenon. And then over a, a period of years, it actually slid out into deeper waters. And we were able to track that through our survey. For halibut, we don't have a, a very direct link between that and the productivity or mortality or growth or, or other things for halibut, mainly because halibut seem to be so plastic in their ability to utilize a wide range of temperatures. Uh, but we are that the, the CCAD information from our survey does provide a, a valuable record of that information. And I think over time, as that, that time series grows longer, we may learn more from it. But it, it is a very valuable component of our data. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lyle. Um, Chuck Ashcroft is up next. For later, <coughs> for later, Chuck. Yes, thanks. Okay. And uh, Malcolm Milne. Yeah. Good morning, commissioners, and everyone else in the room. And likewise, it's good to see everyone in person. I appreciate the dialogue and being able to interact with people. So my name is Malcolm Milne. I'm with the North Pacific Fisheries Association. Uh, we're a fishing group based out of Homer, Alaska, and. The main thing I just wanted to say is that we are, our group is having a real hard time making sense of the stock assessment and the resulting risk table this year. Um, it doesn't seem to match what we're seeing on the water. And to me, it doesn't even seem to match with the FIS and the fishery indicators that, that we do have. Um, I think you've maybe heard a lot of informal discussions around this. I just wanted to kind of state it to, um, to the group and on the record, just the concerns that we're having with that. It's a, it is a major concern and our, and our members urge you, the commissioners, to take that into consideration and then to be precautionary with your, ta with your lim catch mortality limits based on that. And uh, just a big concern. So thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Malcolm, for bringing that to our attention. Um, up next is, and last is Russell Cameron. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Russell Cameron. I'm a fish, commercial fisherman and representative of, of our union, Fisherman Union in BC. But all I wanted to say this morning was was a little bit about the process. So I think the most important thing at, at these meetings is getting to hear the comments of other stakeholders, fishermen, processors, 
And, and I was surprised last night at the end of the meeting where beyond Dan, there was no, no more uh, speakers. Uh, and I, I think that's partly due to the way it's organized and you have to go up and sign a thing and whatever. I think if we managed to get to Victoria in person, that it would be worthwhile to have a mic and, and let people line up as they used to and get a little more off the cuff comment rather than uh, a long scripted thing. So anyway, I'm glad to be here and to see everybody else and uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Russell. Um, and for your comments and for the other speakers that have come up, um, we as commissioners do value the input and in hearing what people have to say. <laughs> Likewise, obviously from conference board and PAB, and we view those as very critical parts of the whole process. And so I guess, you know, as far as um, having some organizational structure around speakers, it does provide for, I think, a more efficient use of time, if you will, our time is somewhat limited. but. Um, we do value the input and we will have other opportunities as this meeting goes forward for um, additional public comment as um, questions that come for, can be brought to the commission for consideration. So thanks again, Russell. Thank you. So um, that's the last speaker, right? Your question? Yep. So we'll then start with the agenda for today. Um, and up first, we're going to be speaking of a hearing from Dr. Planis, and he'll be giving us the project updates. And um, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Planis. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Josep Planas, and I'm the manager of the Biological Order System Science Branch at the IPHC Secretariat. And like, let's see. Let me move slide yeah so yeah this the work that the IPHC secretary is conducting uh, regarding biological and uh, ecological uh, research is intended to provide key biological inputs that feed into stock assessment and the management strategy evaluation process as well as providing basic and applied uh, understanding of, of key uh, biological parameters for uh, for Pacific halibut let's see sorry here we go. Yeah, the uh, biological and system science research uh, program that was completed in 2021 that spanned the years of 2017 and 2021 contemplated uh, work on five uh, key research areas that now has evolved into the following research areas uh, in the current uh, program of integrated research and monitoring that started in 2022 and uh, will last until 2026. And these five key research areas are migration and population dynamics. And this is a new area or renamed area that uh, incorporates uh, the work that we're currently uh, conducting on genetics, uh, linking that with migration and distribution and, and, and uh, population dynamics uh, work. Uh, secondly, uh, we're still conducting work on uh, reproduction. Uh, third, uh, we're conducting growth, well, work on growth. Uh, fourth, uh, uh, we're conducting work on mortality and survival assessment. And finally, we've introduced a new uh, research area that uh, we've labeled uh, fishing technology. The objectives of this, this uh, different research areas are stated here. Uh, the first uh, one for the migration and population dynamics research area is, is really to understand uh, uh, migration and population dynamics throughout all stages of Pacific halibut, from larval ju to juvenile to adults. And the management implications of this work are in stock distribution and regional management. Uh, the second research area, that of reproduction, uh, has as its main objectives to provide accurate uh, maturity and fecundity estimates. And the management implications of this work are regarding female stock uh, spawning biomass. The, the research area on growth has uh, as its main objectives to improve our understanding of factors that are responsible for changes in size and age and the development of tools uh, for monitoring growth and physiological condition in Pacific halibut. And the management implications of this work are regarding our ability to estimate bi biomass. Uh, the fourth research area, that of mortality and survival assessment, uh, the main objective is to improve uh, estimates of discard mortality rates uh, in different fisheries and to evaluate methods for reducing mortality. 
uh, management implications are obviously regarding uh, our ability to estimate mortality. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the research area of uh, fishing technology, uh, the main objective is to develop methods and techniques to reduce uh, depredation and bycatch of Pacific halibut. Uh, and again, the management implications are regarding to our ability to estimate mortality. So I will go through uh, each of these uh, research areas and provide you a summary of, uh, of the outcomes. Uh, the first one uh, regarding uh, migration and population dynamics, uh, within the first five year uh, uh, period preceding uh, the current one, between 2017 and 2021, we conducted work on larval connectivity and juvenile connectivity that allowed us to uh, provide information uh, on larval dispersal pathways and uh, an estimate of the connectivity at the larval level between um, basins, meaning the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea, and also within the basins. Uh, and also to uh, uh, improve our understanding of juvenile migration uh, at earlier stages between one and three years of age. And the results of this study were published uh, in 2021 in the journal Fisheries uh, Oceanography. Also an important outcome of that uh, previous five year uh, period was the, uh, the development and application of genomic approaches, uh, and namely the sequencing for the first time of the complete genome of Pacific halibut. And this is a genomic research that you will see that is crucial for our, uh, our current and future work regarding population uh, genomics and population dynamics. Uh, one particular application that we started to work on, and I'll describe in the next slide, is our current work on population structure. Uh, within the current um, uh, five-year uh, uh, plan of integrated research and monitoring, we're actually contemplating work on several topics. Uh, one is to, uh, um, to conduct work on climate effects on larval connectivity, uh, to uh, examine connectivity uh, with Western Pacific Ocean regions, uh, mostly at the larval level, and the mapping of settlement uh, and nursery areas. Uh, and also uh, to characterize the composition of Pacific halibut in those settlement areas. Uh, and that's where the, the application of the genomic approaches take an important role, uh, because uh, we're gonna be using genetics uh, particularly to address some of those questions. Uh, in addition uh, to the establishment of a baseline of genetic diversity, that's a crucial step in, in, in our analysis for, of stock structure, uh, to delineate a fine scale stock structure uh, throughout the conventional waters, and finally, uh, to uh, develop tools to look at the composition of the stock from a genetic point of view. The two current areas that we're working on are the mapping of settlement nursery areas. I won't speak to that. Uh, we, we're, we're just beginning uh, to uh, uh, get uh, data to uh, fill in those uh, uh, key uh, uh, knowledge gaps. And um, what we're Contemplating now is the is is uh, work on uh, the, the stock structure of the Pacific halibut uh, population. Um, uh, some of the work that uh, preceded this, the development of those genomic resources that are crucial for this work, as you'll see in a minute, were published last year in the journal Molecular Ecology Resources. So, regarding population genomics, the, re the objective is is really to resolve the genetic structure of the Pacific halibut uh, stock in convention waters. Uh, by uh, using genetic samples that have been collected in the winter from spawning groups, and namely uh, uh, groups, uh, spawning groups in the Western Aleutians, in the Central Aleutians, in the, in the Bering Sea, in the Central Gulf of Alaska, and also in Haida Gwaii and British Columbia. And this uh, study that is already uh, uh, in progress uh, has, been, uh, has received funding from the North Pacific uh, Research Board. Um, the approach that we're using is uh, one that it's named a low coverage whole genome resequencing that allows for uh, screening genetic variation at very high resolution. And that hopefully would allow us to uh, obtain genetic signatures that are indicative of each of these spawning groups. Uh, and later on, uh, to develop the ability to assign individuals to those uh, spawning groups. Uh, so this is working progress, and uh, this uh, approach, this genomic approach, uh, in fact, is real, is, is, uh, uh, relies on uh, the genomic resource that we've developed, the Pacific halibut genome. And now we have a second version of this genome uh, that is publicly available. Um, it was revised in March of 2022, uh, and in addition to uh, help us understand the structure of the stock through the establishment of genetic baselines will also allow us to identify potential local 
uh, and on environmental adaptations of Pacific halibut and provide the genetic basis for key life history traits, uh, such as growth, maturity, uh, migratory behavior, et cetera. The second research area, that of reproduction, um, um, uh, resulted in, in the previous uh, five-year uh, period in the uh, complete characterization of the reproductive cycle of Pacific halibut through a histological analysis. So through histology, we characterized all the different oocyte stages, and that was crucial for our ability to uh, classify females according developmental stages and according to reproductive phases, so basically to provide a histological, an accurate histological assessment of the maturity state of females uh, at any given time during the reproductive cycle. And uh, from this information, uh, we uh, learned uh, quite a few things. Uh, one of them uh, is, is the uh, time when it's appropriate for uh, gonad collection during the fish. And we determined that June, between June and August is actually an, an, uh, 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 an appropriate time uh, for gonad collection to revise maturity estimates, which I'll explain in the, in the, in the next slide. Um, this, this information that was uh, uh, derived from, from that initial characterization was also important in comparing the different um, uh, macroscopic and microscopic uh, techniques that are being used for staging uh, uh, female maturity. Uh, as, as you probably know, uh, currently um, uh, the FIS is using a visual characterization of maturity. So that's what we call the macroscopic. There's basically the visual observation of the state of the gonads as they, as they are excised from the body of the female. And, uh, and we use four uh, classification criteria that are based on the visual observation of the gonad. Uh, with this uh, study, we're now going to contrast uh, uh, that uh, uh, maturity classification criteria with uh, the histological classification criteria, which is uh, quite more accurate. So one of the um, uh, expected outcomes of this study is to assess the accuracy of current field maturity classification criteria. Uh, in addition, uh, during that previous uh, five-year period, we developed and applied genetic tests for sex identification, and uh, Dr. Stewart uh, commented on that yesterday, and this is particularly the project where the two IPHC interns that uh, Dr. Wilson um, uh, presented yesterday uh, were involved uh, in 2022. So moving on uh, to the current um, um, five-year uh, program of integrated research and monitoring, what we're actually doing is um, uh, three, uh, 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 or following three main objectives. The first one being the revision of the maturity schedules through histological analysis. And this is what I'm going to be presenting in the next slide. But also I want to mention that in 2023, we're going to embark in a new study in which we're going to be uh, looking at fecundity assessments. Um, for the first time, um, and also the revision of the macroscopic staging criteria. Um, the uh, sex identification through genetic means now has moved from research really into the monitoring phase. And, and as Dr. Stewart indicated yesterday, uh, hopefully in the 2023 stock assessment, we'll have six consecutive years of sex ratio information derived from uh, the genetic analysis of the commercial landings. What we're currently doing regarding maturity this year is uh, we've collected uh, samples during our FIS uh, between June and, and August uh, from four, the four different uh, biological regions uh, with a number of samples collected in each region that will allow us to revise the maturity schedules. Uh, so this is the plan. We're now, uh, as we speak, we're uh, assessing maturity through histological analysis of all, of all those individuals, all those females that are collected coast-wide in order to revise the current maturity estimates uh, through uh, a histological analysis. Um, so uh, please stay tuned and uh, we hope to, uh, by the next uh, annual meeting, have uh, already revised uh, maturity schedules. The third research area that is uh, of growth and obviously one of the uh, initial uh, studies that we conducted were uh, set out to identify and validate uh, physiological growth, mar growth markers that could monitor growth patterns uh, in relation uh, to uh, the historical changes in size and age. Um, this uh, work uh, started with uh, growth laboratory experiments that were done in collaboration with NOAA Fisheries at, uh, in Newport. And uh, we subjected uh, juvenile Pacific halibut to different temperatures, different densities, uh, different handling, uh, manipulations, and uh, from those studies, 
uh, what we learned is that we can uh, we identified uh, several uh, physiological growth markers that can uh, help us uh, understand um, how temperature regulates growth. Um, uh, and uh, we now have a set of validated uh, markers that we can use to estimate the growth status or the growth parameters of Pacific halibut. Uh, so moving on to the current uh, uh, five-year uh, plan of uh, integrated research and monitoring, uh, those are the two aspects that we're interested in pursuing. One is to better understand environmental influences on growth patterns, and that's obviously incredibly important in the face of a climate environment, and also to investigate dietary influences on growth patterns and physiological condition. The fourth uh, research area that is uh, of mortality and survival assessment, and we conducted uh, two main studies uh, in the previous five-year period uh, that uh, uh, focused on uh, discard mortality rate estimations. The first one was uh, related to the longline fishery, and this study is complete now. Uh, where we uh, looked at uh, capture and handling conditions. Uh, we related those to injury and viability assessments. Uh, we also related those to physiological conditions, uh, stress levels, uh, and we also looked at uh, survival uh, through tagging. Uh, so the research outcomes was uh, a full characterization of the injury and viability profiles of, of uh, fish released under different hook release methods. Uh, a full physiological profile uh, uh, of fish of, under different capture and handling conditions, and importantly, uh, experimentally de derived discard mortality rates of uh, Pacific halibut released in the, in the longline fishery. And that will hopefully lead into uh, uh, the establishment of best uh, handling uh, practices uh, in, in this fishery. The second uh, study was a similar one, but related to the charter recreational fishery. Uh, so in this study, it was a similar one in which we related uh, capture and handling conditions. In this case, as you'll see in the next slides, I'll provide a few more details. We compared uh, two uh, types of hooks, uh, 12 and 16 odd hooks. We looked at uh, also injury, viability, and physiological profiles, and we related those to survivability. Um, this is work is still in progress, uh, but what we have already is, as you'll see in a second, is the first uh, experimentally derived estimates of discard mortality rates in this fishery. Uh, and uh, this uh, studies were uh, both uh, the long line and the charter recreational fishery studies were funded uh, by uh, Sultan uh, Kennedy NOAA grant program from uh, grants from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation as well as from the North uh, Pacific uh, Research Board. And so far, we have uh, two papers published, uh, one in conservation physiology and the second one in the North American Journal of Fisheries Management. And we're producing a third one that will be uh, ready for publication. Um, uh, so uh, regarding that uh, second project, uh, the uh, discard mortality rates in the Pacific halibut charter fishery, the objectives were to conduct experimental fishing uh, in which Pacific halibut were subjected to typical recreational gear and handling practices to investigate first the relationship between hook size and catch size. And here we're comparing the two uh, 16 versus the 12 odd uh, sizes to develop injury and physiological stress profiles by taking uh, biological measures, including blood samples and energy levels, and uh, importantly, to quantify and characterize survival by tagging. And, and I'll make a brief mention of the results obtained so far. Um, we used two types of tags to assess survival, survivability of these fish that were discarded. Um, uh, we used wire tags in all the fish that, that we released, uh, 281 fish uh, in total from uh, regulatory <clears throat> IPHC regulatory areas 2C and 3A. Uh, of which 28 has have been uh, recovered to date. This is sort of a long-term project, depending on recoveries of those tags. Uh, but importantly, we use uh, the satellite uh, pop-up uh, archival uh, transmitting tags, uh, or also called accelerometer tags, uh, uh, that uh, provide uh, much more accurate information on survivability uh, over a period of 96 days. Uh, we deployed 80 tags on fish uh, that were classified only uh, in excellent uh, viability, um, 76 of those 80 tags provided functional data. Uh, of those 76 uh, tags that uh, uh, allow us to assess survival or mortality based on the uh, movement patterns of those fish during those 96 days, uh, 48 tags <clears throat> excuse me, uh, reported uh, successfully over the 96-day period. 
Um, seven were uh, fishery recoveries, uh, 21 tags uh, released prematurely, but, but were functional, the data was used. And the uh, results on, on uh, mortality estimates uh, for fish released in excellent condition were uh, around 1.35%, uh, with a 95% confidence interval of uh, between zero and 3.95 uh, for excellent viability fish. The last uh, uh, research area that is uh, of fishing technology, and, and uh, here we're conducting research uh, to uh, uh, investigate uh, methods to reduce whale depredation by protecting longline catches. And this is a study that has received funding from the Bycatch Reduction Engineering Program from NOAA, the BREP program. And uh, the first phase of this project uh, involved the uh, organization by the IPHC Secretariat of an international workshop that was entitled uh, Protecting Fishery Catches from Whale Depredation. We held that uh, online workshop uh, on uh, February of uh, 2022. Uh, it was a virtual workshop, well attended, 72 uh, uh, 74 participants from six countries in total, and highlighted uh, uh, different presentations from um, uh, different groups around the world that have used different strategy for protecting the catch from long lines. And, and one of the examples uh, are, were shuttles uh, from a company in Norway, uh, shrouds um, uh, from, a company, from uh, research groups in France, uh, so basically nets uh, designed to protect the catch, uh, as well as uh, the use of slinky pods uh, from a U.S. company. Uh, now, the second phase of this project is the field testing of the catch protection devices. And we were initially planning on conducting that work last year, but uh, for several reasons, so we had to postpone it until this year. And the objective, really, of that field testing is to, uh, based on the results of that initial workshop, was to design or select uh, several designs. We uh, narrowed it down to two types of designs. One was a reduced sized shuttle design, and the second one uh, are uh, shrouds uh, based on modified slinky pots that uh, protect the catch uh, during haulback. Uh, so the plan is to conduct this field testing uh, in the spring or early summer of this year, of 2023, uh, and in the absence of whales, look at uh, deployment and retrieval logistics of these devices, uh, look for optimal uh, configurations, and to evaluate the basic performance of those devices uh, in the field, uh, looking at uh, the species that, that are uh, uh, protected and, and uh, description of the sizes that we are encountering. Um, uh, before I move on, I, I would like to highlight that uh, today at five, uh, we're gonna have a poster session right at the Palm uh, Court, where um, uh, all these five research areas are gonna be uh, shown in poster format, and we'll be happy to provide more detail, so uh, I would encourage you all to attend if possible. Um, um, I just want to finish by uh, highlighting the uh, externally funded collaborative research that uh, uh, the IPT Secretariat has, uh, has uh, received over the last two uh, fiscal years, 2022-2023, highlighting the two current ones uh, that are the last two projects, the Bycatch Reduction Engineering Program from NOAA and the North Pacific Research Board grant that covers the work that we're conducting on population genomics. And with that, I would like to recommend the commission to note uh, the paper and to provide any redirection or suggestions on the various uh, research streams covered by our mandate. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Planis. A very interesting report on different research projects. Look forward to hearing about the fishing technology one in particular. Um, questions, Bob? Yes, uh, Dr. Planis, on the genomics and connectivity uh, part of your discussion, am I interpreting that um, if you were to catch a, a, a fish in 4 Bravo, that the genomics, you can determine where that fish was spawned? Is that part of this analysis? Yeah, thank you for the question, Commissioner, through a chair, yeah, that, that is one of the ultimate goals that we have is to establish those genetic signatures that would provide genetic information to assign fish to particularly spawning groups. So obviously we're uh, looking at uh, probably a reduced representation of the spawning uh, locations of Pacific halibut, uh, but those are the samples, the genetic samples that we have so far 
from, from five separated uh, different regions. Uh, in particularly, I would like to focus uh, on the fact that we have now samples uh, as early as uh, 2020 uh, collected in uh, Western and Central Aleutians. Uh, previous studies uh, conducted with Pacific halibut uh, using uh, less uh, resolutive uh, genetic techniques um, suggested that uh, there may be a slight structure uh, between uh, regulatory IPHC regulatory uh, 4B with the rest of the stock. So now we have samples uh, from um, spawning groups that at least could allow us to uh, determine whether um, fish could assign to any of those spawning groups. Um, Follow-up question? So as a follow-up on that, um, Dr. Plantis, um, would, would this research lead to being able to determine the success of, say, the Queen Charlotte's uh, or uh, the W ground uh, areas as spawning areas and their contribution to the total resource? Yeah, well, that relies, uh, thank you, Commissioner, for the question. Uh, that, that relies on us having uh, a good understanding and, 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 and samples from all the uh, different uh, spawning groups. Um, uh, what uh, really happened is that we, uh, when we're doing genetic testing and uh, doing those assignment tests for spawning groups, that we find individuals that are not uh, able to be assigned. Uh, and that's uh, that's probably because uh, the collection of samples that we have are probably not representative of the entire uh, spawning groups. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I think in the future will be important is to really um, complement the samples that we have from genetic groups uh, to to add uh, more samples from other potential spawning groups. So so there are different markers for different geographical areas? Well, this is what we're actually trying to find, is whether we can actually find what we call a genetic signature, is, 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 is the presence of markers that are gonna be able to assign a particular fish to a particular spawning area. Thank you. Thank you. Neil. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Planis. I had a couple questions, if I could. Um, so the first one is I'm thinking about some of the comments we heard this morning from Linda and Lyle about the climate change sort of lens on things. And <clears throat> as you were going through the areas of research, it seems to me that there are a lot of places where we are already doing research that would capture how the stock may be changing, perhaps due to a variety of changes in the environment. Um, and I wondered if, uh, well, I mean, I'd like to hear your view on whether I've, my impression is accurate, but, but if so, if you think there's a way for us to um, more explicitly draw together all of the different sort of areas of research that may be supporting our ability to respond to or understand how those kinds of changes may be impacting the stock, so that um, for us as commissioners or for the broader sort of community of users here, uh, we have a bit of um, a view into where are all the different places that the Secretariat is doing research that will sort of support our understanding in light of a, cli a changing climate. So that was my, my first question. Thank you, Commissioner, through the Chair. Uh, yes, uh, I think you put the finger on, on, a, on a key aspect and, and that is really to delineate uh, precise plans to uh, investigate the potential effects of climate change on a number of the biological parameters that we're investigating from, from, from migratory behavior to reproductive behavior to growth. Uh, so climate will impact pretty much every single aspect of the life history of Pacific halibut, uh, including those uh, phases where um, uh, the movement of Pacific halibut is passive uh, regarding uh, their uh, transport through currents when fish have not yet achieved the ability to move by themselves. So um, I, I think that is uh, an important consideration that uh, uh, we've worked also with the Scientific Review Board to delineate those studies uh, and, and um, I at this point that the IPC Secretariat, after uh, having spent considerable time to fill in the basic 
um, biological understanding of some of those processes is now uh, clearly contemplating uh, those studies within our uh, current five-year program of integrated research and monitoring. So climate uh, will play an essential part. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're conducting um, is uh, we're having discussions at the IPHC Secretariat as to which of the uh, climate-related areas would be more prioritary and to do a synthesis of, of, of potential effects of climate on everything related to Pacific halibut biology and, 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 its and, and its relation with the environment. Um, and we will be presenting that uh, to the SRB in our upcoming meeting in June. Uh, so this is very much in the agenda and it's an, in, a, a, an essential part of this uh, the new uh, five-year program of integrated research and monitoring. Yes. That, that's great, thank you. Um, my second question was about something we heard from Dr. Cox yesterday uh, regarding um, you know, what kinds of research might be better suited for internal, uh, internally funded research versus that which might be a better fit for external, just given the control you have over adjusting as you learn over the course of, say, a multi-year project, et cetera. And I was just interested to hear your, your thoughts on, is the Secretariat already doing that kind of assessment of um, what might be uh, better suited to pursue internally versus seek external funds for? I mean, in response to that recommendation from the SRB. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Davis, uh, through the chair. Um, uh, yes, uh, that, that is an exercise that uh, we're, we're doing right now, in fact, um, I can give you a precise example, and that is uh, the one of the top priorities uh, regarding our research program is the uh, estimation of uh, estimation and the recalibration of our maturity estimates. Uh, and that is uh, an example of a project that is funded internally. Uh, the the, uh, the level of priority uh, forced us really to move and use internal funds to fund that project uh, and to start it immediately. So we started this project with a collection of samples in 2022 and we're already processing and 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 histological slides uh right now so that that's an that's an example of an ipHC project um there are aspects that obviously uh for budgetary reasons uh the commission may not be able to fund internally uh and um want example for instance is all the work that we've done related to discard mortality estimations uh, if not entirely has been uh, with external funds um, the uh, population genomics work that is uh, it's it's its inception and it really helped uh, our um, ability to, to uh, fund it externally initially and develop the resources and um, basically conduct the first steps into uh, what is going to be hopefully a very promising area of research. And I think the exercise now is to uh, really evaluate which components of that future research can be funded internally versus externally. Um, there's uh, aspects that uh, I think for budgetary reasons the Commission would not be able to afford. And for instance, one example is work on closed skin marker capture because of the nature and the extent of the project is, is beyond, um, I think it, it's partially beyond the budgets of an of a organization. And that would require uh, most likely uh, draw funds externally. Uh, so those are some of the few examples that I can provide of uh, internally funded versus externally funded research. So thank you, that's very helpful. And, and just maybe more of a comment mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll close. Um, I think this is a, a topic that would be of interest to me to discuss between the Secretariat and the Commission is just how do we make determinations around the kinds of things that as a Secretariat and a Commission we want to invest in as the core priorities for us as a body versus the things that we think are better suited to partnerships, collaborations, um, external funding. Uh, I think some clarity around that that would provide us and and your team with a bit of guidance in that regard i think it would be useful to be on the same page about that so thank you thank you thanks very much neil um any other questions richard yes dr Pla planis uh, on your slide eight you mentioned 
these growth markers. So I'm just curious, could you describe what uh, these growth markers are? You, you use them for temperature, density, and handling, and, and I was just curious what growth markers are. Is, there, is it a physical thing or, are, you know, what are you looking at? Yeah, if I can get... Uh, I am right. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's in there. Yeah, well, we're talking about, um, in general terms, physiological markers. In more detail, what I'm referring to is at molecular markers. Uh, those are uh, either genes or proteins that we have identified to respond to temperature-induced uh, growth variations. So when, for instance, when we've conducted those studies, you know, if I could, sorry, I'm having difficulties advancing the slide to show you what I mean. Right. So um, through uh, different experimental manipulations, uh, we've been able to um, uh, modulate or change the growth pattern of Pacific halibut. And by comparing fish that, for instance, have growth suppressed by low temperature versus fish that have increased their growth rate through increased temperature, we can actually see which genes and proteins respond uh, to the different manipulations. So we can see, for instance, which proteins and genes increase their expression levels or their abundance levels when growth is stimulated and which genes are decreased or repressed uh, during growth suppression. And those are the ones uh, that uh, we have now validated and we have now a set of genes and proteins that we can track uh, that allow us to determine whether that fish, for instance, is in a positive growth trajectory or a negative growth trajectory. So those are the, the, what I'm referring to as, as physiological growth markers. Where I'm actually referring to molecular growth markers in muscle that uh, mimic the, the growth pattern of that fish at that particular time. So it's, it's, a, it's basically a view of the growth trajectory of that fish at the particular time of sampling that will result in a growth change. You see, you stimulated more curiosity. So is this evaluated through some kind of a machine a DNA testing machine, or you know, is yes. it something everybody can have in their back pocket? <laughs> yeah, no. This is this is uh, studies that we have conducted in the IPHC laboratory in our headquarters uh, that uh, are uh, fairly standard laboratory techniques that uh, that we can do in the lab. And in fact, uh, now we've actually validated some of those markers in fish that we've collected in the nymph trawl and even that we've collected in the uh, uh, FIS. Uh, for, to give you an example, uh, we uh, one of the validations that we have done is to compare fish of different sizes that are age match, so fish of the same age uh, of different size bins. And we've been able to uh, look at uh, the expression of those markers and they track the size of those fish, uh, uh, most likely indicating that those fish that are of different size bins at the different at the same age are probably those size differences probably results of different growth trajectories, and we've able to mimic that with those growth markers. Uh, follow up: uh, How far do you have these samples? How far back in history can you pick a sample and look for those markers? Well, unfortunately, these are these are uh, uh, analyses that have been have to be done with fresh samples uh, because they're either proteins or genes, so they're labile. Um, uh, one of the probably one of the benefits of developing those gene uh, the genomic resources, the genome, is our ability to look at the genome and look at whether there's any genes that are related to growth that have changed over time. And we can do that based on our uh, collection of genetic samples. So that way we can actually uh, address that question. This assays would require uh, um, a fresh sample. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Peter? Yeah, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Planas. A uh, question I have is on the uh, sex ratio data you and genetics uh, you've been working on. I know Dr. Cox mentioned that um, you may have enough of a baseline here so you don't have to do it every single year. Uh, do you concur? And would that free up some time to 
you know, pursue some of these other uh, genetic research here. Thank you, Commissioner, for the question uh, through the chair. Um, we have now, well, we, we will have uh, shortly uh, six consecutive years of sex ratio information, and we've actually been working with Dr. Stewart to determine whether we need to continue at that level, uh, whether six years of consecutive uh, sex ratio information from the commercial landings is sufficient, uh, uh, or we can alternate years. This is something that we're evaluating uh, at this time. Um, just to give you an idea of the amount of work involved, uh, we're processing per year between 10 and 12,000 uh, fin clips that we collect from fish that are encountered in, in the ports coastwide. Um, and um, it's, it's been manageable um, at, that, at that level of sampling uh, that provides us a good indication of the saturation, uh, but um, it will definitely uh, be interesting to see whether we can change our plans for monitoring uh, at a different frequency, and that would allow, obviously, more time for other research activities. This is something that we're evaluating uh, as well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Lots of other questions, but I'll probably leave it for uh, some time. Uh, can you go back to slide three, Dr. Planis? Yeah, so um, I think this is a really um, cr critical slide, if you will, to show the linkages between the work that you're doing, uh, the objectives, but also the final column where you have management implications to really show the linkage between uh, the work that's underway and how it's going to affect decisions that we make um, as commissioners. And so, um, First off, I'm glad the slide's there. Second, I was wondering if you, as you go through your presentation, you may be able to incorporate um, some more clearly some of the other slides, um, how those are uh, going to be influencing how we make decisions. So just a comment. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks very much. I don't see any more questions. Thank you again, Dr. Planis. Thank you. So up next, we have Dr. Hicks with the update on MSE. Sorry about that. I jumped the gun. We're having the chairs report an update. Yeah, definitely not, Dr. Hicks. Feel free to <laughs> go on. Uh, it's a morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Really great to see some familiar faces and some new faces again after a few years away. Uh, my name is Adam Kaiser. I am one of the co-chairs of the Management Strategy Advisory Board. I've got a very brief presentation about our uh, most recent meeting in October 2020. I'll let Pete on. And I'm Pete Holson. I'm the other co-chair uh, from Alaska Center. This is trickier than it looks with the mouse. Thanks. Um, OK, so uh, our first meeting in two years of the Management Strategy Advisory Board occurred in October. It provided us with an opportunity to review uh, a number of the simulation evaluations that Dr. Hicks and the team have been uh, completing over the past couple of years, and also an opportunity for the MSAB to consider some administrative uh, uh, changes. These are the two main categories of work that we'll speak briefly to here this morning. Uh, so first, let's focus on the results, which uh, we examined alternative size limits and multi-year stock assessments. So regarding size limits, the, the key takeaways from the MSAB process noted that one really needs to consider regulatory area level trade-offs when looking at specific impacts. If size limits were changed or removed altogether, not all regulatory areas are affected equally. 
So most of our conversations were highlighting the, you know, the value of alternative performance metrics and understanding how size limit changes may affect individual areas as opposed to a coastwide stock, which is where most of the conversation has been focused over the past day. Uh, next slide it talks about our uh, views on multi-year assessments. So regarding multi-year assessments, most of our focus was on the cause and consequences of interannual variability. If a management procedure with a multi-year assessment or multi-year harvest advice were pursued, the MSAB focused uh, most of our conversation on mechanisms to constrain variability, to try to smooth out jumps from, from year to year or in between those years where a, a harvest update is provided. Um, it, on that note, I'll also say that I think a lot of the conversation has been focused on multi-year as stock assessments as the terminology. But I think there's still some conversation to be had about multi-year stock assessments versus multi-year TCEYs. And if we're, uh, I, I think those two things are not the same. And Dr. Cox spoke a little about this uh, yesterday and saying that you know, a stock assessment could be done over uh, a multi-year period, but there's some fixed management procedure, uh, say tied to the FIST or something else, that's used to update harvest advice from year to year. Okay, um, those two points briefly are really where simulation uh, evaluation results were, were focused on in October. Our most substantive conversation was actually focused on the roles and responsibilities of the MSAB. We understand that the commission has a desire to review and adjust the, the scope of the MSAB. So our advice focused on ways to maintain continuity of the expertise that's been developed over the past decade. Uh, specifically, our uh, requests to the commission were around uh, not putting on specific term renewal limits and having uh, staggered terms so that there is always uh, some succession planning in the process. We felt this was particularly important because much of the MSAB process relies on uh, sound working relationships that have been developed over the past number of years with uh, colleagues uh, across the table. And th the subject matter is it can be very complex, it can be very technical, and it takes a certain amount of time to get up to speed. So we really wanted to focus on a smooth kind of transition to, uh, to maintain that expertise. Uh, we also talked a little bit about uh, the value of meeting in person, requesting that we have an opportunity to meet in person at least once per year. Uh, I do feel like we've made reasonably good use of remote meetings uh, when they occurred. I think the MSAB may have actually been the first uh, subsidiary body to meet remotely in the pandemic. So. Uh, we've had a chance to work out the kinks there. Uh, and then our last couple of slides are a few very specific details on uh, requested changes to the, the rules of procedure as we had noted um, in our report. And I think the last slide, please, uh, is a, a bit of a, a one-off around objectives. We had requested some guidance from the Commission around Objective 2.1. I, I think I'm, I'm going to pause this conversation knowing some of the contents of Dr. Hicks presentation where there's going to be uh, more discussion on objectives and uh, and leave it to uh, to Alan to get into that piece. So that commissioners is our very brief presentation of the MSAB. I'll pause here to see if Dr. Elson wants to add anything. No? Okay. That's our presentation. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks very much Adam. Questions? Bob. Yeah. Adam, could you, uh, with regards to the size limit discussion, you indicated that uh, the committee suggests that not all areas are treated equally. Could you give an example of that discussion at the MSAB? Certainly. So uh, as we gain a better understanding of, about stock distribution and how different sized halibut are located throughout their range, we understand that different fisheries are going to intercept different sizes of halibut at different rates, and removal of size removal of the size limit will affect uh, those fisheries differently. If you have more small fish, removing a size limit will mean um, you know, a different realized mortality than than other areas. We also noted in our conversation that there wasn't a whole lot of performance metrics around the efficiency of the fishery, at least in in the window of time that we were looking at. So there may be value at uh, looking at different performance metrics 
to understand really what the consequences are, whether they're, they're economic or, again, fishery efficiency, that uh, would decide whether or not that's uh, a management change that helps us better meet our objectives. I don't know if uh, Pete or Alan have anything to add around what's been realized in the most recent simulations of uh, changing size limits at a regulatory area level. Any specific examples? You'll go to it in your presentation, I think. Yeah. So as a follow-up, uh, Adam, is the current size limit of 32 inches, did, it, did that also create issues between regulatory areas? Or just reductions to different size limits? A size limit, uh, any size limit, regardless of whether it's 32 inches, will have different implications, different regulatory areas based on the distribution of the stock. I can't say whether it's a problem, because it depends on what the fishery objectives are. Thank you. Any other questions? Peter. Uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, on your uh, discussion with I don't know, rules of procedure. Was there any discussion on uh, having the MSAB become more of a focused group? Uh, so maybe, uh, you know, the size of it. Uh, yeah. We, we talked a, a little about uh, focus in terms of what we're actually talking about and uh, a, a little bit about membership, although it is a bit of an awkward conversation to figure out who's who's in and who's out uh, on, on the board. Um, I, I would say my observations, not, not necessarily for the whole board, but my observations over the past number of years is the MSAB process has spent a lot of time focused on uh, evaluating management procedures at a regulatory area level, because that's where the interests of the folks around the table are. That's a really challenging conversation to have given much of the trade-offs are, are really commission or commissioner decisions. So it's challenging to build consensus when you've got such a diversity of opinions. And I think that's part of the reason for the, the pace of, our, of, of the MSAB's work, not the, not the MSE process, but the MSAB's work. Um, I think the, the real value in the MSAB uh, going forward will continue to be uh, providing observations, supporting the evaluation, helping the Secretariat and Commission focus in on what really matters to the fishery and to stakeholders, and then allowing the you know, decisions about trade-offs between regulatory areas to occur at the Commissioner level. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Any other questions for Adam? Nope, uh, thank you very much, Adam. So now um, we're going to have an update from Dr. Hicks. Good morning, commissioners, and good morning, everyone in the room. It is a pleasure to be back here in front of everybody and um, presenting in person. I'm realizing it's been a while since I've stood in front of a crowd this large. It's a little easier when you're online, so I'll calm down in a second. Um, okay, so today we're going to present um, the results of the management strategy evaluation. This has been a two-year process for these results, and um, the key's not working. As a reminder, the program of work for the MSE has, um, it was defined for the previous two years, 2021 through 2023, and here we are at the end of that. And we had a number of tasks assigned by the commission for us to investigate. Um, some of these are related to what I'm calling the framework, and that's development of this MSE framework. Um, there was some clear direction on management procedures, um, including size limits and multi-year assessments, which I'll talk more about. And then finally, always considering how to evaluate and present the results. And that's always an ongoing thing for at least me in how to improve these presentations to all of you. Regarding the framework, um, we have a number of tasks. I'll just briefly go over this, that we have an operating model that has been reviewed by the SRB. We have the framework that's been um, reviewed by the SRB, and it includes a number of different features, including things like decision-making variability. Um, 
And it's the, the good news about this framework is now that it's developed, we can produce MSC results much more quickly. So we might be able to do some um, quick investigations within a one year framework. But as the stock assessment evolves, as management decisions evolve, especially around distribution, we might have to update this framework, which shouldn't take too long to do now that it is developed. In terms of the evaluation tasks, we have the MSE Explorer online, which is a um, interactive tool that um, anyone here in this room or anywhere can use to evaluate the results and look at the MSC results yourself. And tonight there is a um, little workshop we'll have in this room on visualization tools at IPHC and the MSC Explorer is one of those tools. Um, just a little plug there. So um, in this evaluation for these results, we're gonna independently evaluate size limits and multi-year management procedures. And we're gonna focus on some priority coast-wide objectives um, that have been developed with the commission over the past few meetings. So I put up here the priority coast-wide objectives in order of importance. And this has been um, developed with the help of the commission and the MSAB in previous years. And we basically have four main priority objectives. If you focus on that left column, you'll see the general objective as it's defined. It's related to conservation 1.1, uh, maintaining a spawning biomass that optimizes fishing activities 2.1, and then providing fishing yield, directed fishing yield, and limiting the variability in those mortality limits, as Adam mentioned, was an um, a, a important concept for the NSAB to consider. And I want to point out, um, as Adam alluded to, there was an objective that the MSAB wanted a little bit more clarification on, and this is objective 2.1. And I want to note here, as it's been defined through the MSAB process and the commission process, something that uh, you know, I blame myself, escaped my, uh, my, my level of notice, is that there's a little bit of inconsistency between the general objective and the measurable objective. One says around a target, the other says above a target. And I think um, that we are suggesting to actually have a language at or above a biomass target that would optimize fishing activities. And this, I believe, is consistent with both the Canadian Fisheries Act and the U.S. Magnuson-Stevens Act. As you can see, some language that we pulled from sections there um, do mention at or above um, biomass levels in both of these um, legislative pieces. So our suggestion for Objective 2.1 to clarify that for the uh, Commission to consider is to change the language as is noted in the yellow here. Um, and just basically having at or above and then 50% or more of the time in that objective. So let's get on to some results, the management procedures. The first management procedures, um, type of management procedures we investigated are size limits. And the commission directed us to investigate the current size limit of 32 inches. And so you consider that the status quo and then a 26 inch size limit, and then no size limit. And I wanna note that the MSC framework was update, updated in these past few years that we can investigate any size limit and have a bunch of really useful metrics come out of the simulation work. Um, so there's some really meaningful results beyond what I'm presenting today. I wanna to also note in all of these simulations, we considered five different distribution procedures. And what I mean by that is how the TCUI is distributed across the regulatory areas. So that was a source of uncertainty, not something we're investigating directly. So it's included in these results as potential management actions in the future. So focusing on size limits, I first wanna orient you to this table shown in the, um, on the slide. And that is, these are the performance metrics that are related to those four objectives that I presented earlier. So you see under biological sustainability, we have the probability any relative spawning biomass is less than 20%. And what, what that is associated with objective 1.1. And you can see that it passes across these three management procedures where each management procedure is presented as a column and we have management procedures with no size limit on the left, a 26 inch size limit in the middle, and the 32 inch size limit or status quo on the right. 
So we have the four performance metrics down there related to the objectives, their values, and then we can evaluate those different management procedures. So some of the things um, that we might conclude from this are it meets biological sustainability. It passes that, um, that first performance metric. It has a slightly lower biomass with a 32 inch size limit, meaning the spawning biomass is at a slightly lower level, although it's not at much less. It has slightly less variable without a size limit, although I don't think that's really meaningful differences. And that's the bottom row that you're looking at there. That is the AAV or the average annual variability. How much on average would you expect that TCUI to change each year? So 17% change, that's within the range that Dr. Stewart showed um, for the past management actions. And then finally, the most important result from the size limit analysis is there would be about a 3.7% increase in the TCY without a size limit. So removing that size limit would result in the TCY increasing by about 3.7%. And you can see on average here in the, in the short term, the next uh, four to 14 years, it would increase from about, on average, 58 million pounds to about 60 and a half million pounds. And I wanna note that most of that increase occurs even when moving to just a 26 inch size limit, that it's a 2.7% increase. And that's because the directed commercial fisheries are mainly interacting with fish above 26 inches. So the real clear gain there is an increase in the coastwide TCY, but that's not the end of the story. One of the directions from the commission a few, a couple of years ago at an annual meeting was to investigate the long-term effects of, of size limits. And I note that because at that time we investigated short-term effects. And that was a presentation Dr. Stewart gave, I believe, believe at the 97th annual meeting. And Dr. Stewart showed that in the short term, there's about an 8% gain in the TCEY. And that's consistent with these simulation results. You can see on the left part of the plot, that's, that's the recent years. And this is showing the percent difference in the TCY without a size limit. So the value of 10 on that vertical axis means there'd be about a 10% gain in the TCY if the size limit was removed from the directed commercial fishery. But as you see in these simulations over time, that the, the percent gain is um, reduced. And that's because there's a lot of uncertainties that come in in our projections into the future. There, um, the short, in the short term, there's been um, a low weighted age, there's been this recruitment gap, and there's other considerations that are affecting the high gains in removing the size limit. Over time, there's uh, larger weighted age potentially, higher recruitments, lower recruitments, and those, those all affect the size limit. So really the, the end result here is the gains in the TCUI are dependent on stock conditions, but over the range of uncertainty, the variability we would expect, you would most often get a gain in the TCY if removing the size limit. And that gain on average is about 3.7%. So some other outcomes, and this relates to the conversation uh, commissioners were having with Adam Kaiser uh, a minute ago, is um, the, the results were similar across IPHC regulatory areas, but they were different for IPHC regulatory areas. I believe all IPHC regulatory saw an increase when removing the size limit, although that range of increase uh, varied among the different regulatory areas. And I note 2A had um, some, it had the constant 1.65 in here, so even removing the size limit didn't change that constant 1.65. With a higher fishing intensity, um, there's a larger percent increase in the TCY when removing the size limit. The harder you fish, the more gain you get when removing the size limit. Uh, if the fishery was to target smaller or larger fish, say the size limit caused some change in behavior of the fishing, um, targeting larger fish to get a better price, for example, um, it still held, there would be an increase in the TCY, but um, it was uh, a larger percent increase when, um, uh, wait, oh, sorry, reduced gains when targeting larger fish. And then finally, and an important result, is we have directed commercial discard mortality, and removing the size limit would reduce that mortality by about 78%, which is a considerable decrease, because there wouldn't be the releasing of those fish back into the water. 
So an important concept to consider with size limits, though, is the proportion of under 32 uh, fish or under 32 inch fish in the landings. And I note this because there's could be a different price for under uh, fish under 32 inches. We haven't had um, landings of U32 fish in, in decades, except in recent years from our uh, fishery independent set line survey, we've been um, landing a few of those smaller fish. But what I want to note here is now we're looking specifically at directed commercial landings in the proportion of the O32 and the proportion of the U32 fish without um, size limit compared to the 32 inch size limit. So on the right, we have a 32 inch size limit, 100% O32 fish, and relative to um, itself, it's of course 100% of the TCY. If we go to the no SL, which is second from the right, we see that there's a 5% increase in the directed commercial landings because now it includes U32 fish, but only 93% of those landings are O32. So 7% of those fish are now under 32. So there's an increase in the total landings, but there's a larger proportion of U32 fish in the landings now. So what are the consequences of that on the directed commercial fishery? And what we should think about is in terms of value. If there's a different price for U32 fish, we might wanna consider that in these results. And we have seen that the under 32 price being paid for from the FIS survey, which is a very small amount of U32 fish on the market, is about 88% of the price of an O32 fish. And that's always been above 80% in the last four years that we have been selling those fish. Um, and so we developed a metric called the equal value price ratio. And all this is, is the ratio between a U32 and an O32 price. And what would that ratio have to be for an equal value to the fishery? What proportion of the O32, fight, O32 price would a U32 fish have to be for the value, for the value to be equal to the directed commercial fishery? So we can think about this in the purpley pink area on the top, that would indicate that the U32 price would have to be equal to or greater than the O32 fish for there to be an equal value to the fishery. Even though we're increasing the yield, the, um, uh, potentially increasing the yield, what is that ratio have to be? How much do you have to get for a U32 fish? The white area shows it as a fraction. And just to summarize these results in general, the price of a U32 fish would have, would have to be on average between 25 to 75% of the price of an O32 fish for there to be an equal value to the fishery when removing the size limit. A bit of a concept to wrap your head around. But then I wanted to show you also that this is also dependent on stock conditions. Right now, there must be a lot of U32 fish out there. The 2012 year class is coming in, et cetera. And so there'd be a, a eight to 10% gain in the TCY and the yield. And the price for a U32 fish doesn't have to be as high for there to be an equal value to the fishery. The fishery gets a, um, the same value as it with and without a size limit. But over time, this changes, and it depends on stock conditions again. So we really have to consider stock conditions in this, but we can look at the long-term results here, which integrate over a range of different stock conditions, and it still shows us on average, it's about a 50% price ratio for equal value. So that's the size limit analysis and summary. Let's take a look at multi-year stock assessment. And we were directed to do this by the commission two years ago. And what a multi-year stock assessment means, as Dr. Cox explained yesterday during the SRB presentation, is not conducting the, um, the stock assessment every year. So not doing the full stock assessment as was done this year, and also not doing those update stock assessments, um, but actually taking the time off of the stock assessment using another method to set the TCUI and, um, and then potentially focusing that time on other research. So I wanna note in these analysis, the FIS always remains as an annual survey. So there's always data coming in every year of, from the FIS and that's very important to consider here. So we investigated um, 
three different types of multi-year approaches. One is the annual, the status quo, as you can see is called MPA 32. We have a biennial approach where we conduct a stock assessment every other year. And then within biennial, we had three different options for how the TCY was set in those non-assessment years. I'll explain those in a moment. And then we did a triennial um, at the request of the SRB actually, and, and also the commission said, if you have time, do that. Um, and we did the triennial approach with only one method of setting the TCY in non-assessment years. So in conversations with the SRB, we actually recommend considering option B as the method for setting the TCY in non-assessment years, and that is actually using FIS data, and as Dr. Cox explained, adjusting the TCY in proportion to how the FIS results change in those years. So instead of using a stock assessment, you see FIS went up, let's adjust the TCY up, FIS went down, let's adjust it down. We, had, we looked at two other alternatives, and that's just a constant TCY across all those years. Um, and then also a constant coast-wide TCY, but adjusting the distribution. Um, and there's some, some concerns with those, um, but um, we're gonna really focus on option B in these results. So here's the table again with the metrics on the left and the management procedures across as columns. And so the different management procedures I explained on the previous slide, annual, biennial, and triennial uh, frequencies for the assessment. And um, if we look across this, biological con uh, conservation objectives are met, they all pass. And there's some differences here, mainly in um, the AAV. And so I wanna focus on those last two rows, those bottom two rows, and you see that the TCYs are pretty similar for the annual, biennial, and triennial option B. That's the one that's adjusted by the FIS. Um, and that was in, um, you, you know, that result agrees with what Dr. Cox mentioned yesterday in that using the FIS, it's such a good survey. It has great coverage. It has a, a great result that it's very similar to using the assessment. The assessment and the FIS are often in agreement. So that uh, shows that result. And then the annual variability between those three options, option B, is uh, about 17%. It doesn't change a lot until you get to the triennial and it drops quite a bit to 14% on the right. The other two options, A and C, which we're not really gonna focus on here, they show a, a decrease in the variability from year to year, how much that TCY changes year to year, but it also shows a decrease in the, in the yield that you would um, expect from the fishery as well. So it seems like the real winner here is a similar yield as an annual assessment, um, but a significant drop in the variability from year to year. And that's seen in the triennial assessment on the right. So some other outcomes to consider. Again, these were similar across the regulatory areas where the triennial showed a decline in the variability from year to year in the TCY at the regulatory area level. Um, and it really showed that significant decrease going to a triennial um, frequency. And it showed similar um, results by increasing or decreasing the fishing intensity. But what we really need to consider here are costs and benefits. And we worked with the SRB in, in defining and identifying some costs with multi-year assessments. I'm just gonna focus on the top two because those relate to that option B, that empirical rule. Um, and one is detailed management information is not available every year. You won't get to see Dr. Stewart up here presenting to you an assessment every year. I know I'll miss it. Um, not sure Dr. Stewart will miss it, but we'll see. A, slier, a slightly higher chance of a smaller stock size as well. So there's a slight bit more risk to lowering the, um, the stock to a lower level with the multi-year assessment frequency. And what it really happened was there was more variability in the spawning biomass going to a, a triennial frequency. But some of the benefits, sorry. It, uh, Some of the benefits are um, 
as we saw, reduced interannual variability in the TCUI. We saw the triennial frequency drop that average annual variability to about 14% change in the TCUI each year. Sometimes it might be 1%, sometimes it might be 18%, but on average it's about 14% change. Um, there's that multi-year stability and the, the short-term predictability of the TCUI. You're going to see survey results and you're going to know what's going to happen to the TCUI in those non-assessment years. There's that transparency there. Um, using the, the FIS data in that year, as, in that transparent process, more time for focused assessment research. As Dr. Cox mentioned, there's a lot of research that the SRB would like to see, be see, to see done um, that we just don't have the time for doing a stock assessment three to four months of the year. Um, time to collaborate with like Dr. Planas in the Secretariat. Uh, triennial frequency would be consistent with the current assessment cycle of an update of a full assessment occurring every third year. And then Dr. Cox mentioned this also has precedent at other fisheries commissions. So there are some benefits there. And, um, And so what are the next steps? Now that we have these results, what are the next steps in the management strategy evaluation process? Well, one of the goals of management strategy evaluation is to put management into practice. So the next step might be to update the IPHC harvest strategy policy um, and identify areas that are complete, write up that document with the areas that are complete, and then also um, identify areas that are incomplete and on those in the future. And then whatever comes out of this meeting and the next year meetings in terms of agreements and distribution, to then have a look at that specific distribution procedure uh, within the MSE and optimize if there's any optimization of the coast-wide specifics, such as an SPR value, um, size limits, again, we could investigate, but more specific to any agreements coming out of this meeting and future meetings. So the last two slides are a summary. This table again with the five management procedures really for consideration here. We've seen all these results and I just want to show you a different view of this table but in graphical format. We have the relative spawning biomass up on the left and so that shows the spawning biomass relative to an unfished spawning biomass with the pink area being below 20 percent which is where we really want to avoid. Um, and the gray horizontal line being the target of 36%. And this shows the uncertainty on here as well, different percentiles from these MSC simulation results. You can see the TCUI, um, short-term TCUI in the right top plot there. And you can see the range is quite large, but really you gotta focus on the difference between these management procedures. Hard to see here, and that's why numbers are sometimes better. Um, and then the average annual variability on the bottom left. And you can see that average annual variability in the simulations. You can see the real decline in the triennial on the right there in the light green. But you can see that, you know, there's a range in here too. And sometimes some simulations had quite a bit of variability from year to year. So recommendations, noting the paper, uh, agree to these priority objectives, including the modification to what's be here, maintain the long-term coastwide sp female spawning biomass at or above a biomass target of B36, 50% or more of the time. Endorse the performance metrics that are related to those objectives, which were presented throughout this presentation. Note the, the five management procedures uh, for presentation here for decision making, which is a smaller subset of all the management procedures that we did investigate and talked about with um, the MSAB about. And then these last three recommendations are really key recommendations for the commission. Um, to note the evaluation of, noting the evaluation of size limits, to recommend starting the process of changing regulation and updating the harvest strategy policy to specify no size limit. These results really support moving to no size limit, considering other uh, metrics, including economics metrics, such as this price ratio. Request considering no size limit um, evaluations in the future MSE or of including included in the management procedures. And then request using additional objectives and performance metrics when evaluating um, future management procedures, including alternative size limits and 
This was uh, mentioned by the SRB as well as the MSAB. Um, and these are other uh, objectives related to such things as efficiency, as Adam mentioned earlier, um, and opportunities for specific fisheries. So some development of the metrics might be useful. And then finally, to endorse a triennial assessment frequency with an empirical rule in non-assessment years that uses FIS data, and then request updating the harvest strategy policy document and identifying areas that are missing and could use further specification. Uh, with that, I can take any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Hicks. Questions, Peter? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Hicks. Uh, first question I have is uh, in regards to applying the FIS uh, with the biannual or triannual. How did you determine that? So it was a coast-wide uh, reduction. I think we kind of find ourselves in this predicament now. Do we, did you do a coast-wide cut to every regional area, or did you do it specific to how the FIS adjusted in that particular uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Commissioner DeGrief, uh, through the chair. Great question, and sorry I didn't go into the details. I want to keep the presentation short, but um, to, to specify that, we use, uh, in this empirical rule, we use the FIS data exactly as um, our management procedure operates now, and that is you define the coast-wide TCY, and then you distribute that to the individual regulatory areas. So instead of using the assessment to do that process, you would use the FIS, and if the FIS drops, coast-wide FIS results dropped 8% uh, or whatever it is, then the TCY would also drop 8%. And then we distribute that coast-wide TCY using those same FIS results to the individual areas and using whatever agreements are in place um, for that distribution procedure. Yeah, thank you. And just just as a follow up, you would use like five different procedures. I can't remember, but you'd use multiple amounts, right? That's correct. And this these simulation results, it wasn't clear what the future management and distribution would look like. So working with the commission, we developed five uh, distribution procedures, five different methods for distributing mm -hmm. the TCY among regulatory areas that would represent the uncertainty or the uncertainty we have about what a potential distribution procedure would look like in the upcoming years. So we had five different ones in there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Neil? Uh, thanks for the presentation, Dr. Hicks. A lot of really interesting work. Uh, so just wanted also to recognize the time and energy that's been invested by you and by the members of the MSAB to get to this point. Uh, we've done a lot to get here, so thank you. Um, I have two, two comments or questions, or question and a comment. So the SB 36 and the language of target versus a point to stay at or above, I think the, the way you described that distinction was very helpful and important. Um, if uh, where we are landing, is that treating it more uh, in line with the language of Canadian and US legislation would be the at or above language. I, that, that makes sense, right? It's familiar to us. Um, <clears throat> I think that may change the way we assess its suitability as a value, right? So my understanding is that to date, it's been discussed as a target something we want to be at. And uh, if we are changing that to be a point to stay at or above, um, it, I, I think we should at least consider whether, we, whether the value we're assigning um, of SB 36 is suitable. Because it essentially, I think, I'm assuming it would become an upper stock reference point, right? So if we hit that upper stock reference point, my assumption is we would take some kind of management action in the way we treat the stock to push the stock above that point again. That's a very different treatment than if it's a target and we're trying to stay close to it. 
Uh, and I'm not sure if the MSAB has discussed its suitability as a point to, to stay at or above. So that's my first Maybe there's a question in there somewhere or something you'd like to say in response. Um, the other observation I have is that your description about uh, the outcomes of analysis about size limits and about the frequency of assessment um, really go beyond uh, what we're trying to achieve from management with respect to our conservation objectives. And so a number of folks this morning have mentioned, you know, the value of convening as a group here to have input to um, the commission's work. And, and I think these are very key examples of where your collective discussion and input on the trade-offs between some of these choices are really going to be important to us as commissioners because they relate to fishery objectives. And so I hope over the course of the week, we have time set aside in your processes to really be digging into the way that you view these trade-offs and um, providing feedback to the work that Alan and the MSAB have generated uh, so that we hear from you about perspectives uh, on those things. Thank you. Yeah, uh, John. Thanks, and thanks, Dr. Hicks. Um, I'm uh, perhaps not connecting the paper with the slides, but I'm, I'm looking at uh, page two on the paper where uh, you note that the reference fishing intensity of, of uh, SPR 43 was used for all of the management procedures. Um, so I, I'm thinking that we need to uh, perhaps revisit this in light of the change of understanding of natural mortality. and. Uh, particularly in reference to achieving objectives like the, the probability of declining future trends in spawning biomass. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, th thanks for the question through the chair. Um, a, a really good question and noting that one, yes, all these results presented today had a SPR 43% or that fishing intensity um, level. We did investigate other fishing intensity levels um, in, and those are available on the MSE Explorer and found similar patterns across the management procedures. But I, I do agree with you as there are changes in the stock assessment, as there are changes in agreements of how to distribute or distribute the TCY, we do want to revisit the, um, some of these simulations with the MSC. So I believe that's a good idea. However, saying that, part of the goal of MSE is to develop a management procedure that's robust to our uncertainties. And part of those uncertainties are natural mortality. In the stock assessment, some uncertainties included in natural mortality. In the operating model for the MSE, there's even more uncertainty included for the range of natural mortality. So Dr. Stewart and I had some discussion about when we saw the stock assessment results, I had all these simulations completed and we're like, are we concerned about this? And looking into it a little bit more at that time, um, these results still hold, the patterns across them still hold, and there would be likely little change in um, updating the operating models to be more congruent with the stock assessment. And that's because the operating model has uncertainty on all four of those individual models and natural mortality. So it covers the range of what has changed in the stock assessment already. Thank you for that. Um, and then um, a couple of comments. So on, on the recommendations for us here, um, the second is that the commission agree to the priority coastwide objectives. And um, that seems um, somewhat concerning to only focus on the coastwide results. Uh, it, some management procedures, as, as Dr. Hicks noted, uh, may affect one biological region or regulatory area differentially, uh, you know, more than others. Um, stakeholders and commissioners, it seems to me, need to see that information. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure we wanna prioritize strictly at the coastwide level. And then, um, Additionally, with the, the corresponding recommendation that uh, the commission, commission endorse the uh, performance metrics associated with the coastwide objectives, uh, again, they're linked to the coastwide objectives. And it, it seems to me may uh, 
result in a lack of resolution for us to understand implications at the regional level and at the regulatory area level. Um, uh, those are some, some concerns that I would have with uh, those recommendations. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, did you wish to have a comment on that, Alan? Sure, th thank you. Through the chair, I just want to note that um, the key word there are priority objectives. Um, there is a larger set of objectives that, and thankful um, to the participation of the MSAB in developing those objectives, um, which I believe is an appendix in the document. Those objectives um, do include regulatory area specific objectives. Um, I don't want to lose that in this process, but sometimes it's easier to focus down on some key objectives, depending on the management procedures that you are evaluating at the time. Um, given that, um, and I believe a comment was earlier, you know, working with stakeholders here at this meeting and identifying their metrics that are important, I think is useful as well. Yes, John. Uh, just as a follow-up, Paul, uh, you know, I, I understand this is, may not be to the exclusion of, of uh, information that would give us that higher level of resolution, but nevertheless, it reflects a prioritization, and, and uh, by virtue of that, I think maybe a diminishment of attention at the regional level and the regulatory area level that, again, is potentially concerning. So um, this may be something that needs a little bit of further discussion before we can come to yeah, thanks, John. Um, I think there's going to be discussion on a number of items here. And so I think um, Neil's point was that we're seeking input from um, our uh, reflective, uh, respective uh, conference board and PAB that would be helpful as well. And I think as well for us as commissioners that we need to reflect on what's been for put forward as well. And I think it'd be a good opportunity for us as commissioners to get together and have a discussion about what's being proposed. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and I, I just want to acknowledge that uh, the Secretariat is trying to be responsive to our feedback uh, about trying to come to closure on some of these issues. So I don't want to diminish that. We don't mean to be giving you mixed signals. Um, but uh, these, are, these are tough issues. So I think we've got a little bit more ahead of us. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, John. Any other questions? No, I don't see any. Thanks again, Dr. Hicks. So um, this would be a good time for a break. Um, we will come back in 15 minutes. It's now 10:55. Uh, All right, uh, we're going to start with the IPHC fishery regulations. Uh, over to you, Basser. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, everyone. I'll now provide the introduction to the IPHC fishery regulatory proposals for 2023. I will note that uh, this is a presentation that will provide the introduction to the process itself. Then I will introduce all the regulatory proposals for contracting party proposals as well as stakeholders' proposal, there will be also an opportunity for the proponents to provide comments and answer any additional questions the commission might have on these proposals. This presentation will be also provided to the conference board and processor advisory board at any time of their proceedings as requested. So please note that proponents are also welcome to, uh, to participate in these two sessions and provide comments to those two uh, bodies as uh, uh, needed. When it comes to the process, please note that we have on Thursday on the agenda the time to revisit regulatory proposals. This will be after we have the conference board and processor advisory board 
uh, board reports ready. This will be the time when we will ask the Commission to make decisions on the proposals. Today we'll just uh, have the introduction to those proposals. On Thursday, we'll ask the Commission to take the decision on as many proposals as possible to really clear the deck for Friday when we'll move to the mortality limits discussion. To uh, this year, we have in total 11 regulatory proposals. Four of them are from the Secretariat, uh, three from stakeholders, and uh, four from contracting parties. All but three of them were available to the Commission for preview during the interim meeting. And as a reminder, the proposals are available online. They are on the IPHC AM99 website. These proposals were submitted within the appropriate deadlines, that is 30 days before the session started. And uh, they were published within one business day as required by the rules of procedures. One proposal, the proposal A4, was revised and a revision one was published on January 11. Each proposal is typically accompanied by an appendix that provides a suggested regulatory language should the proposal be adopted. One proposal for 2023 also deferred the development of the uh, regulatory language to the Commission. For the proposals, the final text of the IPHC regulations will be prepared as we progress with adopting uh, the proposals. This document with all the changes per Commission's decision will be shared with both contracting parties for implementation and uh, further uh, use within the, uh, within the national regulations. Before I move to the actual proposals, just a few reminders. Uh, each proposal is submitted through the IPHC Fishery Regulations Portal. This is available on our website. And the deadline, as I mentioned, is 30 days. And for this year, that was 24th December of the last year. Stakeholders, are also, uh, stakeholders can also provide comments on fishery regulations or regulatory proposals. And these were accepted up until the day before the meeting. And any additional comments can be also submitted through the sign-up sheet, and that uh, these comments will be uh, provided during the uh, public comment just after the regulatory proposals presentation. When it comes to Secretariat's proposals, the first proposal, A1, is a framework for introducing mortality and fishery limits into the IPHC regulations. This adds the table that explicitly states the DCUI by IPHC regulatory area and the table that provides fishery limits that result from these DCUIs uh, per the domestic share catch sharing arrangements. I will note that the, this, this proposal is really just the framework. So on Thursday, we'll make a decision on that framework only, and the tables that will be introduced through this proposal will be filled then when we get to the mortality limits uh, on Friday. The second proposal has to do with the commercial fishing periods. This is when the commission is making the decision on this uh, commercial season dates. Please note that with the transition of management authority to the IP, in the IPHC regulatory area 2A, the commercial periods for the non-tribal com direct commercial fishing, uh, these will not have to be set by the IPHC because these will be uh, moving forward the responsibility of the of Pacific Fisheries Management Council and NOAA Fisheries per recently published rule and uh, with that, the IPHC really no need, uh, does not need to consider setting dates for the 2A non-tribal director commercial fishery. Uh, these, these dates will have to be, however, set by the contracting party within the overall season dates that the commission will decide for the commercial fishing uh, season. 
Uh, I will just note that if the Commissioner has any specific questions on the 2A transition, uh, now there will be a time for, to, because this proposal is, effect, uh, is affected by that transition, uh, I, I'm happy to answer all these additional questions on the trade transition, but we'll have also representatives from the NOAA fishery specific region that are available and can answer those questions. Uh, the third proposal accommodates the remaining uh, components of the transition of management in the IPSC regulatory area 2A. Adoption of this proposal is required to formally relieve the IPHC from the responsibility for issuing licenses for uh, fishing Pacific halibut in IPHC regulatory area 2A. This includes both uh, commercial, incidental, and charter uh, fishing in 2A. And also relieve the IPHC from issuing annual management measures for the non-tribal direct commercial fishery in 2A. Uh, per published rule by NOAA, uh, these tasks are now the responsibility of NOAA Fisheries and the Pacific Council. The proposal A4, this proposal has been developed in collaboration with both contracting parties and includes minor amendments that improve the consistency of the IPHC regulations. The majority of the proposed changes are really related to the consistent use of the definitions within the regulations, and these do not affect how the fishery is executed in practice. These really are related to how the regulations are written and the consistency of the regulatory text within. Please note when we will be making the decision on the proposal A4, we'll be making, precision, uh, we'll be making the decision on the revised version of that proposal. So the uh, proposal marked with REF1. And with that, this, these are the four secretary's proposals and I'm happy to take any questions on these uh, four proposals. Or as I mentioned, we can have additional discussion on the 2A transition with NOAA fishery specific region. Thanks very much. Any questions? I don't see any. There are four proposals from contracting parties. Proposal B1, this proposal provides a methodology for adjusting charter management measures in IPHC regulatory areas 2C and 3A. And these are, this is the framework for mortality, uh, based on the mortality limits by the APHC. So when making the decision on this proposal, uh, this will be a decision on that framework and the actual management measures will be defined once the mortality limits are set by the commission on Friday. We have here in the room Kurt uh, Iverson, who is available to provide additional details and answer, available to answer any additional questions on this proposal. Thank you, Dr. Hunchesak and uh, members of the commission. For the record, I'm Kurt Iverson and I'm a fishery management specialist in the Alaska region. This particular uh, regulation proposal, B1, is something that the Commission sees every year. They've been seeing it since uh, 2014. And uh, at this point, as Dr. Hunchesak uh, explained earlier, at this point, the proposal is merely a placeholder. And it will be updated later in the week when the Commission determines the mortality limits. And our colleagues at the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, on an annual basis, have developed management measures that are designed to keep the charter halibut fleet within its allocation. And uh, these management measures were developed through the North Pacific Fishery Management Council process. That's a public process, beginning with the charter operators themselves, presented to the council, and ultimately recommended by them to you at this meeting. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Any questions? No, I don't see any, Kurt. Okay. Thank you.
Moving then to proposal B2, this proposal proposes a change to section 28 regulating recreational fishing in IPHC regulatory area 2B and modifies daily bag limit to free fish per person. As a reminder, this measure was introduced before on a temporary basis and the current proposal introduces this on a permanent basis. Current measure is going to expire on 31st of March, 2023. We have Gwen Mason here ready to speak on behalf of this proposal. Thank you very much. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Gwen Mason. I am the incoming halibut coordinator with the fisheries management team with DFO. Um, this is my first annual meeting, so it's been a very exciting time. And I'm looking forward to getting to know everyone throughout the week. Um, thank you for providing me an opportunity to speak to the regulatory amendment proposal uh, Canada submitted with the intended implementation up in the 2023 IPHC regulations. And as Basha had mentioned, um, this is for the regulatory area 2B um, for implementing a flexibility in the bag limit um, to increase from two to three per day in season when appropriate. So I'll give a brief overview of the proposal and then I can answer any questions that might come up. So this proposal seeks to amend section 28 of the IPHC fishery regulations to allow the current, albeit temporary, 2B recreational bag limit of three fish per day to remain in the Canadian recreational fishery. Um, this was originally tabled at last year's annual meeting, um, followed by a detailed presentation regarding the management of Canada's recreational fishery. Um, and this was given as special session 12 last February, and it was also brought to this past interim meeting in November as well. So the purpose for this proposal is to provide the flexibility to move to three per day bag limit and implement a new maximum ceiling for the 2B daily limit of three per day. By doing so, this would align IPHC fishery regulations with Canada's domestic sport fishing regulations. It would also simplify unnecessary regulatory complexity. More importantly, this change would allow Canada greater flexibility and autonomy to manage its domestic fishery to within its domestic annual allocation. The default IPHC daily bag limit of two fish per day constrains Canada's flexibility to make these critical in-season changes to the fishing plan to support meeting RTAC goals and Canadian domestic fishery objectives. And this has been demonstrated by the need to implement the three per day flexibility in the past two fishing seasons. So the past two years, when the review of mid-season catch monitoring has shown that the recreational sector was unlikely to reach its allocated TAC, Canada has used this flexibility and implemented a, an increase to the ba daily bag limit from two fish to, per day to three fish per day. This was done on September 10th in 2021, and then again on August 20th, 2022. This did result in an increased catch for both August and September of each year. This was compared to the original forecasted amounts prior to the season beginning. Um, however, total catch in Canada's recreational sector in both seasons has remained under its allocated TAC. Um, if you're interested in some more details, catch tables of Canada's recreational fishery by month and by management area are provided in Canada's uh, national report, which I'll be speaking to this afternoon. So I'd like to highlight that the Canadian Sport Fishing Advisory Board, the SFAB, has a long history of collaborating with Fisheries and Oceans Canada in Canada's endeavors to achieve IPHC objectives while also maximizing Canadian domestic objectives. I'd also like to remind folks that the recreational halibut fishery is proactively managed in season in that both DFO and the SFAB meet monthly to review timely and robust catch estimates and to consider and evaluate appropriate fishery management measures going forward. So there is a very hands-on and responsive management of this fishery. Um, under this proposal, DFO would retain the ability to vary the Canadian daily limit in season up to a maximum of three fish per day. If required, um, and if in, in line with in-season catch estimates and management goals. I'd also like to remind everyone that the Canadian recreational fishery has a domestic overage policy in place, so that in the rare occurrence that an overage did occur, this would be domestically deducted from the next year's available TAC. Um, and I do believe it is the only recreational fishery amongst the regulatory areas to have this policy in place. So in the document that's available on the IPHC annual meeting website, um, there are the suggested modifications to the fishery regulations in red text. And at this point in time, the recommendation is that commissioners note that this regulatory 
regulation proposal, which proposes the daily bag limit of up to three fish per day per person in the recreational fishery in IPHC regulatory area 2B. So that was a very quick overview um, and I'm happy to accept any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gwen. Any questions, uh, John? Thanks, Gwen, a couple of questions. Uh, so my understanding is that this uh, additional flexibility was put in place the last couple of years given, well, in the context of the extraordinary circumstances of the COVID pandemic and what that may have been doing for, for flexibility for um, harvest. Um, I wonder if you could characterize how how close uh, Canada was able to get to the catch limits uh, pre-COVID, whether whether there were those sorts of operational considerations in the pre-COVID years. Thank you, Commissioner Kurland. Um, I can get that information. I don't have it up on my screen just yet. Um, but prior to COVID, so 2018, 19, and we can take a look at 2017 as well, I do believe that the the catch estimates for the recreational fishery came within about 10% of the allocation. So this was um, this was managed through, throughout the season um, and, and reviewed, and there has been a, a time in the past, I believe it was 2017, where during one of these in-season meetings, um, both SFAB and DFO had determined that what they had originally forecasted was um, was below what the realized catch was and they preemptively shut the fishery down so we did not go over our TAC. So while prior to, while the last couple of years, fishery has uh, behaved slightly differently due to COVID, um, in the 2022 season, it, it's it's quite comparable with 2018 and 2019. Okay, thank you. And um, I, I wonder if you could characterize uh, when in the season this flexibility becomes important from a management perspective. So in the last two years that this um, flexibility has been implemented annually, um, it, the decision was made in 2021 at the August meeting um, for implementation on September 10th. And then this past year, it was made at the July meeting with the Halibut Working Group or the Recreational Halibut Working Group composed of members of DFO and SFAB. And that was put in place or discussed and decided in July to be implemented on August 20th. Okay, so so uh, if I hear you correctly, August September timeframe to to make those adjustments. And um, prior to this, in going from one fish to two fish in, in 2020, was it a similar kind of framework, kind of a late in the season adjustment? So I it was before my time in, in 2020 um, with what the the regulations were in terms of bag limits. I know in in 2021 and in 2022. The, the option that was decided upon at the annual SFAB uh, groundfish shellfish working group meeting in February was to allow either one large fish or two smaller fish. Um, in 2020, um, with a, a change from one to two fish, I'd have to go back and look at the data again. I'll talk to the, the recreational folks that are here in the room as well. Okay. I, I don't mean to drill down too far into the weeds here, but what I'm trying to understand is operationally, when has this flexibility to allow for an extra fish been important for management of the fishery? And it, mm -hmm. it sounds like that's late in the season. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it, it's certainly been in the, the latter half of the season. We wouldn't want to implement it too early when we don't have a good idea of... Um, what realized catch is looking like compared to the forecasting before the beginning of the season. So we, we review it on a monthly basis. And if about midway through the season, about midway through the summer, it looks like we're targeting under our forecasted amounts and there's some wiggle room there, we would open up that flexibility, but it's not necessarily guaranteed. Okay, helpful, thanks. And, and just for my fellow commissioners, I, I guess I would note um, comments or questions uh, that came up in our discussion of this at the interim meeting the potential marketing implications of a three fish bag limit. Um, if that were in place only for area 2B and not for other areas, uh, conceivably that could result in a situation with some some adverse consequences for area three fish. And so just want to remind folks of that discussion from the interim meeting. Thank you. Yes, thanks, John. Neil? So just on this point about marketing implications, which I think we have heard a number of times, <clears throat> some observations to add to that. 
If we look at the way that recreational fisheries are managed in each jurisdiction, there are a number of ways in which each one is unique. We have jurisdictions that have annual limits and others that have none. We have some with size limits and some with none. We have different daily limits. So, you know, I, I caution this idea that there is <clears throat> one metric uh, along which all recreational fisheries must align. I think that will constrain us. I think it leaves less room for us as management agencies to adjust in response to what we're seeing in season. And I think it's a bit of a red herring, to be perfectly frank, um, in that there are so many things about the design of recreational fisheries that are unique in each jurisdiction. Uh, I think what we, what we want to focus on is what tools do we have available to us that can be adjusted in season to effectively manage these fisheries within their allocations. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Any other questions or comments? Um, Commissioner Royal, I do, if it's okay if I respond to Commissioner Curlin about the, the marketing. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, so thank you, Commissioner Curlin. Um, I do recall our, our conversation and the discussions that we had in um, at the interim meeting. Afterwards, I did follow up with several representatives of the Sport Fish Advisory Board to get their thoughts on this and, and get a better understanding of, of how marketing and business planning for charters and lodges work. So after speaking with them, um, uh, several members that have decades of experience, particularly in the marketing of the marketing and business operations of charter operations, guide operations, um, all of the planning for an upcoming season takes place in the prior summer and fall. So given that this proposal is for the flexibility to move to three per day, given that in, in the past two years it's occurred midway throughout the season, and when all the, the marketing and business planning for an upcoming season goes into place, there's no advantage for these business operations to advertise something that might happen. It's, it has never been the intent of this flexibility um, with a view of, of marketing or competition in mind. Um, the intent has always been to allow for in-season management decisions to allow our recreational fishery to fully utilize this tack mm -hmm. each season. Um, in particular, for, for guests that would be booking um, multi-day charter trips, they would need to book several months in advance, um, particularly if they're booking with BC Parks. Bookings need to be done about four months in advance before they would actually be able to get a site. Um, so this flexibility and the way that it's been implemented in the past um, and the way that's being proposed doesn't provide any marketing advantage. When these plans are, are being put together, they're being put together so early, and it's not necessarily guaranteed that this flexibility will be in, enacted. So, thank you. Paul, oh, may I just follow up? Yeah, thanks very much, Gwen. Did you said you had a comment, John? Yeah, thanks. I um, appreciate the additional context there, Gwen. And, uh, you know, again, my, my concern here is that it seems like the flexibility may have had some additional justification during COVID given that the effects on, on the fishery um, and added constraints at that time. Uh, but, you know, again, if this is, if this is put in place as a uh, change, that seems like a, a very different approach um, that uh, you're, you're right that, you know, people market way in advance, but uh, seems like that's something that could be, of note to potential consumers and and it's a just wanted to keep yeah thanks john i guess um are you seeking then that we have uh, congruence across all regulations in the sport fishery well, I, I don't think that's what's part of this regulatory proposal no it's not but you're picking on one particular aspect and uh, i find it odd that um, we have a very structured, well-managed fishery done conservatively with, as Gwen went through, is requires um, a payback if one goes over. I don't know that there's any um, such stipulations in the U.S. recreational fisheries. And here you pick on uh, an issue of round marketing, and we're seeking some flexibility so that we can continue to manage the fishery. So I don't 
go I go back again. Are you are you seeking to see something that's a similar across all fisheries? Um, well, you know, again, it, it's similar now that there's a two fish bag limit um, that's throughout the range of, of Pacific halibut. So uh, I think we're interested in not having a disparity that could create some marketing implications for the charter sector, et cetera. And, you know, it may be that there is is a rationale for continued use of this flexibility as Canada has used it the past couple of years for late in the season uh, to discuss it. Yeah, okay, thanks, John. Any other comments or questions on this? Nope. Thanks again, Gwen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Moving to proposal B3, this proposal adds flexibility to existing sport uh, Pacific halibut fishing regulations in Alaska and allows limited consumption of recreationally caught Pacific halibut on board of charter vessel and pleasure craft while retaining existing regulations that provide effective enforcement of daily bag limits and position limits. We have again Kurt Iverson here who can provide comments and answer any questions on behalf of NOAA Fisheries to this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hudson Zach and uh, members of the commission. This is a relatively simple regulation that would allow some flexibility in uh, our recreational fishing regulations. It would allow limited amount of com consumption of halibut on board recreational fishing vessels and still allow effective enforcement of the bag and possession limits, which is our ultimate goal is that enforcement. And currently in Alaska, if there are no size limits in effect, halibut may be filleted into four fletches. And those four fletches have to remain intact on board the vessel that allows the enforcement officers to enforce those bag and possession limits. This proposal would seek to allow those anglers on those boats to consume one fillet from one fish. And that would, they could take that off their bag or possession limit at any time. Relatively simple, flexible regulation. And are there any questions? Any questions for Kurt? No, there are none. Thanks, okay. Kurt. Thank you. Moving to proposal B4, this proposal prov provides an update to IPHC regulatory language regarding the qualifying logbooks in IPHC regulatory area 2A. NOAA Fisheries proposes that the Pacific Coast Groundfish Non-Troll Logbook can be used to report Pacific halibut catch in IPHC Regulator Area 2A. This revision would benefit certain vessels operating by relieving them from the need to produce duplicative logs. NOAA Fisheries indicated that the new logbook includes all the data fields required by the IPHC reporting and would be readily available to the authorized representative of the IPHC at the time of landing for inspection. Before I hand over to present this proposal to NOAA Fisheries, I'll just note that the Secretariat, with respect to this proposal, we would like to suggest that should this proposal be adopted, the Commission recommend that the IPHC work with NOAA Fisheries on data sharing arrangement to retrieve Pacific Calibut data submitted to NOAA via this new type of logbook. So this is separate recommendation from the Secretariat. But now I'll have here Frank Lockhart, who is available to provide additional details on this proposal as well as answer any uh, comments. There is a button on top. Press and hold. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Frank Lockhart. I work with the West Coast Region uh, for NOAA Fisheries. And uh, Dr. Huttenzak gave a more thorough explanation of the regulation that I was planning on. It is very simple. We have a new uh, logbook requirement uh, in the West Coast Region, and this simply this change simply allows that this 
logbook will fulfill the requirements for IPHC as well. Uh, since you mentioned the recommendation at the end, uh, we would be happy to work with uh, uh, commission staff on uh, data sharing uh, to make sure that works smoothly for both of us. And with that, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Are there any questions for Frank, Bob? So, Frank, as, as I understand this uh, rule that uh, in 2023, there will be available a paper logbook, and then after, in 2024, this will be a requirement required electronic logbook. Is that accurate? That is my understanding as well. And uh, Nobody threw anything at me, so I think that's correct. <laughs> so. And... Um, Getting the, the, the logbook, if someone is going to use the, the paper logbook, my understanding was that could be secured through uh, ODF and W and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, or is that through NIMS? Um, that is one that I'll actually have to turn in. I, I, I don't know the answer to okay. that. So, yeah. I just want, there's some two-way fishermen that uh, aren't maybe aware of, of this requirement, so trying to educate them <laughs> at your expense. Okay, right, so no, thank okay, you. Well, okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Are there any other questions for Frank? No, thank you, Frank. Moving now to stakeholders' proposals. A proposal C1 includes three variants to, for added flexibility to allow recreational fishermen in Alaska regulatory areas to possess specific halibut for eating and preservation. This proposal suggests amendment of the same section as previously presented proposal B3. And this proposal has been already on the table last year but was deferred. Proposal was submitted on behalf of John Fields, a recreational fisherman, and we have here his uh, counsel, Brian Schroeder, who can speak on behalf of this proposal. Good morning. Uh, there we go. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Brian Schroeder, and I represent John Fields. We've offered Proposal C-1 for uh, the consumption and preservation of halibut on recreational fish by recreational fishers on multi-day trips, as described by Dr. Hudensack. Uh, this is similar to Proposal B-3 from NOAA Fisheries, but there are some differences. Uh, being at this meeting and listening to the weighty discussions you've all started to have on the livelihoods of stakeholders here, uh, we realize our issue is a pretty limited one and we thank you for taking time to consider this. Um, with, and I won't go through the proposals, Dr. Hutnazak has done that, and we, uh, we've offered them a year ago, and we also made the same proposal at the interim meeting, so this has been in front of the uh, commission before. Uh, it changed because it makes sense. Recreational fishers ought to be able to enjoy eating their catch. It seems pretty, pretty logical. Um, Certainly, if somebody's out for a day trip, they can come home, come back to their to their home or wherever they're staying. They can process the fish. They can eat as much fish as they want. But similarly, if a fisherman's out for a multi-day trip, they should also be able to en enjoy their catch as well. And that's the basis for our proposal. Um, Mr. Fields, as we provided some written comments from John Fields, it, it kind of expressed his frustrations. You know, he, he looks at it and sees that if he had an apartment in Sitka, he could go out for a day trip, come back process the fish, eat the fish, do whatever, you know, he, he wanted to do, but because he has a boat and he likes to travel around and see other parts of Southeast Alaska, that, that he's, he's more severely limited and, and not able to really enjoy the catch in the way he wants. And John's not alone. In, uh, there were five proposals made in 2018 to make a similar change. Uh, one also this year besides ours. The commission uh, put together a working group that in 2018, but that group at the time didn't recommend any, recommend any proposal. This year, there's a significant difference, though, and that difference is that uh, that, that NOAA fish, NIMS Fisheries, or NOAA Fisheries, also recognizes the concern and has agreed to make a change, as discussed by 
uh, by, Mr., uh, by Mr. Iverson. And we appreciate the fact that they've done that. And we appreciate the work that Mr. Iverson's put in on this to help make it happen in his role as the recreational fishing coordinator. But it's probably not a surprise, I suppose, that we'd like to see, uh, we don't think their proposal goes quite far enough. You know, we would ideally like to see that the, the multi-day recreational fishers be able to process their catch. Whether you're a recreational fisherman or a commercial fisherman, I think everybody understands the best way to maintain the catch, to have it in your freezer for the winter, is if you can process it as soon as possible. That's, that's what Mr. Fields act, is asking to do. The current regs don't allow for that. They only allow, as again, as Kurt put, four fletches. That's a pretty large piece of fish if you're bringing it out for a meal later in the winter, and nobody likes to waste fish. So we're, we're again, this is to us is logical. Be able to cut, process the fish into, uh, into, by, into meal sized portions. Um, and we'd like you to consider that option. However, if the commission's not willing to go that far, um, we, you know, we think there can be a compromise there. We think one portion of the fish, of a fish per trip is not enough. If maybe there was one portion of, a fi of each fish that was caught during the trip, that would be enough for people to eat, at least to, to really fully consume it you know, during the trip. Um, however, at the end of the day, whether it's one of our proposals or NOAA's, we think this is a positive change. And we think it, it should happen, and we we, we uh, recommend that the that the commission go ahead and vote for a change, one of the changes that is proposed. Um, again, we'd like to thank you for taking time to consider this, and I'll be available for commission for questions. And I'm going to be around if there's any questions for the boards. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much, Brian. Any questions? I don't see any at this point. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Moving then to proposal C2, this proposal suggests a constant DCY floor in the IPHC regulator area 2A. This proposal was submitted on the behalf of the Maca tribe, and we have here Timothy Green, who will be available to present more comments on this proposal as well as answer any additional questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Um, honorable commissioners, thank you for, for this time to bring this proposal forward on behalf of 2A. Um, you have the documents in front of you, so I just want to highlight some of the um, some of the reasons that uh, we're we're bringing this forward. And so, um, first off, there's a, has been shown that there's no biological concern for this proposal in moving forward. Area two's impacts to the coastwide stock are very minimal in relation to the overall biomass, and that's been supported by some of the presentations that have gone on here. Um, in yesterday's, uh, yesterday's session. This uh, meets the needs of the users in Area 2A, supporting those communities in a sustainable level. It's stabilized those fisheries. It's made management um, you know, very reasonable as it's been you know, leading up in, to the time before this that that was a very hard thing to, to manage those, uh, that allocation that, that was given for 2A previous to this uh, agreement. There's full support to the tribes, states, the federal government, National Marine Fisheries, and the IPHC Secretariat in maintaining the 1.65. And because of these factors, we recommend the commission prioritize the 1.65 and focus on achieving that allocate, allocation in an agreeable process that maintains and preserves the healthy fishery in an area found to be robust through established IPHC processes. I think we'd like to thank uh, Dave Wilson for his role in recommending this process and, and how it's worked out over the last four years and uh, along with our U.S. commissioners in that process. And so uh, this was fairly short and highlighting those, uh, you know, those successes that we've had to this point. And I'm happy to answer any questions, concerns that, that you might have. Thank you very much. Any questions, Neil? Thank you for joining us today and for speaking to this. Um, I wondered if you'd be willing to share a bit more about the macaws perspectives around sharing the conservation burden of the resource. We, we all know stock goes up and down. How do you see this proposal for a fixed amount or a floor um, aligning with that as a principle? Thank you, Commissioner. That's, that's a great question. Certainly uh, it's something that we've 
talked about and addressed, uh, you know, certainly amongst the tribes and, and at the, the other uh, stakeholders in Area 2A. And, you know, when it comes to the conservation measures and conservation concerns, you know, that's, that's something we're always paying attention to. You know, currently the data is showing that things are trending in a positive um, direction with the weight per unit effort and, uh, um, and the numbers per unit, you know, those are trending in a positive direction. And, you know, currently at the, you know, the 42% of the unfished biomass that we're at is nowhere near the, uh, you know, the 30% uh, conservation necessity measure. And in light of those, uh, you know, those issues, uh, you know, we're feeling comfortable with this proposal, but directly to your uh, question, you know, if the data, if the research starts to show that things are trending in a different direction, and that there are conservation concerns that uh, that we're seeing in the area, in Area 2A, you know, we certainly will take appropriate action. I think Macaw, you know, in, in particular, and certainly, you know, the other 13 tribes that that are part of Area 2A, you know, those, you know, those values that we have, those sovereign values that we have around the resource and the fishery, you know, we're going to make those decisions for the resource, for the benefit of the resource, so it's there for future use. Should we hit any of those, um, you know, critical points in in management that we need to take conservation measures, you know, we'll do that. So, but but as I understand it, you're asking us to fix this floor in regulation. So, so where do you see the the adjustments? fitting in with something that's a fixed value in regulation? See, I don't have the specific answer to that, you know, without, without the support from some of the technical folks on, you know, on that specific part of it. And, you know, happy to, uh, you know, to have some discussion this week on that specific uh, question and, and get you an answer to that. You know, more than happy to do that. Thank you. I think that would be quite helpful. Um, I just have one more question. So, you know, I, I imagine that some of the things that you were describing, um, you know, the needs of users, the value of this for stabilizing fisheries, and the challenges of managing allocations amongst different groups, are familiar and probably of interest to other regulatory areas in this room. Uh, but we are not at this point considering fixed values in other places. So I, I wondered if you could, if there's more that you would like to say about what distinguishes 2A from others. I, 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 I understand and can relate to some of those objectives that you have. Uh, I think they are objectives that most others would share. Um, but why would we contemplate a fixed value here uh, when we don't contemplate that elsewhere? Right. Well, that certainly is, uh, you know, and understandably so, that that can be a, a question that, um, you know, that this body is often, often seen. I think what distinguishes Area 2A is certainly the, uh, the sovereign rights of the tribes that are held within there and that legal responsibility, you know, to those tribes to meet their treaty right obligation, which is a legal right that um, that has to be met under under our current current law that that uh, we work with our federal government on. And and so that's, you know, a fundamental we see that as a fundamental issue in 2A that has to be built into this process. And and just, you know, just as uh, as some little background, I'll be super brief here, but, you know, that halibut fishery, you know, for macaws, I'm sure this body has heard before. You know, macaws, a single tribe, has, out of canoes at treaty times, harvested, you know, nearly 2 million pounds of halibut out of that area. And so right now we're sharing 500,000 pounds amongst 13, 13 tribes. And uh, so that's where we're at with the resource. And, and that's what's happened to that resource, you know, by 
all the use and, and efforts that have been going on. And, uh, and so that impact on our legal rights, our treaty rights, is, is something that I think has to be accounted for. It definitely distinguishes Area 2A in that. Um, I don't know if that fully answers uh, your question, but I think that's, that's a major, a major talking about. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, that addition. Um, I think the more we understand the sort of specifics about what those rights are and how they may equate to the need for a fixed amount will be helpful. Um, I mean, certainly for the benefit of the whole audience here, we, we have, um, many, many First Nations in the Canadian context who also have asserted or court um, uh, confirmed rights to fisheries in, in a variety of ways that are critical for us to consider in that jurisdiction as well. So the more we can understand what may distinguish, if anything, uh, this proposal from 2A from these other contexts, I think will be helpful for us. So thank you. Okay. Any other questions, um, John? Thanks. Thanks for speaking of the proposal and, and uh, appreciate your responses to Commissioner Davis. Uh, so um, I'm wondering what uh, Macaw and the other treaty tribes would think of continuing to incorporate the 1.65 million pounds into the commissioner's uh, decision-making process for TCEY. Um, in either annual or multi-year agreements, but recognizing that quite a bit of discussion and thought has gone into that number, and um, there seems to be quite a lot of consensus around it from users that uh, the Secretariat has confirmed, as you indicated, that there haven't been conservation concerns with that number. Um, if, if we were to uh, continue to be mindful of that request from 2A users uh, going forward in our our process of setting TCY across the regulatory areas, would that meet the, uh, the essential objectives of this proposal? I think if you look at that in a, uh, you know, if it was a short-term agreement, you know, it could meet it over the short term. I think over the long term, you know, there'd be some concerns, uh, you know, from the tribe and, and it would all be depend on the details, right? Of how, how do we embed that in the process that, that certainly recognizes that uh, um, that treaty right at the appropriate level. You know, you know we've had a long history in, in just trying to participate in this body, and um, and we're not there yet, quite quite frankly, from from our perspective, and, and being recognized at the level as a sovereign government, speaking as a sovereign government, to to be able to. Uh, make sure that those rights will be secured. So if there's ways we can find to, to take care of that concern, you know, we'll, we'll definitely come to the table and, and uh, you know, be a part of working that out. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Timothy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to proposal C3, this proposal suggests adding flexibility to existing recreational Pacific halibut fishing regulations in IPHC regulatory area 2C and allow limited consumption of Pacific halibut on board of unguided recreational vessels. A proponent was Tim Cooper. Unfortunately, I don't believe he is available to answer comments or questions from the commission, but I will provide a short uh, introduction to this proposal. This proposal is very similar to the one presented on behalf of NOAA Fisheries, the proposal B3, but it is somewhat more limited in terms of its applicability as it applies only to regulatory area 2C and only to unguided fishing vessels. Uh, I can also provide any additional comments on that if needed, thank you. Any questions? No. As noted earlier during the beginning of the presentation, stakeholders could also submit statements up until the day before the annual meeting started. On the website, you can find the information paper 
uh, info 01 that is collating all the received comments within the sub and these comments had to be submitted within the submission uh, time frame and that has been uh, again one day before the meeting we have received altogether 11 comments for this info 01 paper all but two were related to proposal c2 Eight were in support of this proposal, and one noted a concern about this proposal. Uh, additional one was in support of proposal C1, and one called for overall caution when uh, setting mortality limits within all IPHC regulatory areas. All these uh, comments are available in this information paper 01 that, is, uh, that can be found on the website. And with that, I will conclude my presentation, but I am available to answer any additional questions the Commission might have on both of the proposals, but also on the process in general. As a reminder, as well as I mentioned earlier, I will be also making similar presentation to the Processor Advisory Board and Conference Board, and the proponents of all the proposals are welcome to join these sessions as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions uh, for Basha? No, thank you again. Um, so we're just checking to see who has public comments or questions. Chuck, I think you had, so why don't you come up and we'll just see if there's others. Oh, it's on. Good. Yes, thank you very much, Commissioners, uh, for allowing this opportunity. Uh, I actually have two uh, had two sections I was going to speak on or ask about, and one of them being on uh, uh, the uh, the first one being on the SR. I guess it's the SRB or the research, and it was Dr. Planis that might be able to answer a question, or and it might also involve Dr. Hicks as well. Yeah, that's fine, Chuck. Um, I see Alan's here. I don't know if Dr. Planis is, but, um, oh, yes, he is okay. as well, so go ahead. So I should ask this one first before sure. we go on to the regulatory yeah. world. So, okay. Uh, I, in, in, in reading the document 12, I noticed, and, and, I, and the, your presentation actually did explain it, uh, and it's, I would, it, it's, it stated that the update of maturity schedules based on histori histological based data, the IPHC secretary is undertaking studies to revise these schedules in all four areas. And I'm asking the question if I'm correct in assuming that this is going to be done over time in order to determine the match, the, the length of time that the migrating fish, especially the young fish, uh, are spending in a certain um, or area in order to, which would likely change its maturity schedule. I would, and that's the other was on um, uh, on the two appendixes, appendix one and appendix two, and it's on the ranking and by in bio, uh, the appendix one on biological research uh, ranks the. Um, uncertainties and parameters for both stock assessments and research, including migration, as being first uh, priority. And in Appendix 2, in the MSE process, the, uh, the, the rank biological uncertainties and parameters for management strategy evaluation and their potential links to research areas and research, including migration, which is the top priority there. Now, my question then out of that is, is there a ranking of which appendix might be ranked first in, in, in proceeding? Uh, does the MSE recommendations remigration inform the maturation uh, schedule uh, research? Or, uh, or will the maturation uh, schedule research occur concurrently with the MSE work? And this is don't that if necessary. Thanks very much, Chuck. Um, Alan, you're up. 
Sure. Thanks for that, and thanks, Chuck, for the question. I, um, I'll try to answer a little bit about the research as well for Dr. Planas, and feel free to fill in there. But I, I think the key to this is um, the key to the maturation work is understanding the maturity schedule of uh, Pacific halibut and understanding that maturity schedule across time and across space as well. So looking in these different regions and looking across space. How that relates to migration, I don't know that we're quite ready to link that to migration at this time, but it's a very good point. Is this dependent on where the fish spend their spawning time or their summer time? Um, and that's a question we'll look at as we gain more data. In terms of importance, I believe we can view that as looking at it as migration is probably one of the key uncertainties we have in the MSE process and is a very important um, uh, topic to investigate more and get better understanding of for modeling in our MSE process. We haven't linked that specifically with maturity at this time, um, that migration process in the MSE especially, but um, we need to understand these basic biological principles, as Dr. Plana said earlier today, like maturity. We haven't done a study in many years on maturity. So once we understand these biological principles, then we can understand the linkages between some of these concepts as well. Thank you. Um, Joseph, did you have anything you wanted to add? No? OK. Anything else, Chuck? Not on that, no. But on, I, I, I would, I would, I was going to sp also speak for the prop B, proposition B to, yeah. uh, in support, and uh, needless to say, I am speaking in favor of the regulation to allow a maximum retention of three halibut per day. And I don't want to go over everything that Gwen Mason, our halibut coordinator, did state. Um, I would like to add, though, that the province of BC also takes part in our, and is an active component in our, our halibut working group uh, and fishing board. And I, I guess I have to really explain a bit on our process in developing our fishery. Uh, once, the, once obviously IPHC makes the determination of our TCY, then we go into a series of meetings uh, to to trying to design a very conservative approach to our TAC. And because we know we can adjust certain aspects later, uh, but very little. So we design it conservatively. We want to stay within our attack. Um, and it's our best opportunity to get through the end of the summer by starting and picking a, a choice that's very conservative, as our mandate is to try to extend our season till the close of, of December. And it's basically critical for us to be conservative enough so that that, that does, is allowed. And in doing so, we do leave fish in the water and we're uh, quite okay with that within reason. Um, and, and as pointed out, we're the only jurisdiction that does have an overage provision. And, and the department also does and has closes down in season when they, the department has felt that we're getting close to or going to be going over tack. Um, and in, in designing our, our fishery, we have right now we're on, on, on a hybrid, using, utilizing a hybrid methodology where we have uh, minimum and maximum sizes. And, and that cannot be varied in season. So once we choose a size, we, that is our size for the season effective April 1. We also have that at the, uh, the maximum number of halibut that can be trained on an annual basis, and that also cannot be varied. And in, in pointing out what, with our, our hybrid and our request to have a maximum allowable possession of three in regulation, this is only on the small fish. We, our, our fishery is, is small fish and a large fish, or two small fish and a large fish in this case three fish and a, a large fish over uh, at this per current amount, 133 centimeters, you're off the water. And that is included for your possession as well. So it's one in possession or three in, uh, one in possession and daily limit or three in a daily limit. And that would be 
also your possession. So you just move on it and look at another. I also have, and you did ask the question on, on how close we got to our limits, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in, in the discussion uh, with Gwyn. And I'll note in the last 11 years, our, decision, our decisions have resulted in our staying under TAC in nine of the 11 years, as well as leaving 1,111,974 pounds of water, net pounds of, wa of fish of pounds in the water. And this includes the two years in that period that we did go over. Uh, part of when we, when we have our in-season meetings and when we design our fishery, we design by si the size of the fish, length of the fish uh, per month, per area, regulatory area in Canada, uh, of which there's several. And we know that those, those sizes are, and, and the are different, uh, by area. So, and it changes. So monthly, our, our, for our tables we, 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 we work with monthly, and we meet monthly in season, uh, from through till October, November, as the as the, uh, the halibut committee, which includes Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Science, uh, as well as the province, as well as our Sport Fishing Advisory Board, on the halibut committee. And we compare it monthly. We compare our forecasts on sizes as well as the uh, numbers per month, and we adjust and we and we then forecast in the future as we start seeing what the catch has been like. So we either raise or look at what it would look like if we we're going to be higher than normal for the, for the fall months or in the summer months, and we try to adjust as well our fishery. And, and also if we decide, anytime we decide to make this move as a, as a sport fishing advisory board and a halibut committee, which includes the, the Department of Fisheries, Oceans and the province, this really pretty well requires that the province and the, uh, certainly the department uh, and the SFAB, we need to be in agreement at the time. We just do it at, on one, not a choice the, the halibut committee makes on its own. And as such, I hope I've explained enough on how our process actually, and how, how it's pretty uh, in depth. And uh, I know, and I'm speaking for the SFAB, SFAB in uh, appreciation of the IPHC commissioners support approving of that regulatory change. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chuck, for the uh, additional information. I'll just see if there's any questions for you. Uh, John. Thanks for that additional perspective and, and the emphasis on the conservative approach. I appreciate that very much. Um, I guess what I'm, I'm struggling with is, wouldn't you be able to, wouldn't the, the system have the flexibility that is sought here uh, by being able to implement that late in the season, uh, as opposed to it being a, a three fish bag limit for the entire season? And and I, I ask that informed by uh, my understanding of how this has been implemented the past couple of years, which has been late in the season. Yeah, thank you for the question. And, and, and in some respects, yes, something is better than nothing. However, that would be, that would then restrict us from earlier in the season if some, something not expected shows up and we're no, catching nowhere near our catch on a monthly basis and to start looking at something that may take place earlier in the year as we did this last year and we could have done it as it stands in July and still probably met our and stayed under TAC but that's just upon reflection and would, we did not know that at the time you just don't know what's going to happen in a fishery year by year as we've seen this year and that and it would it could end up being it would be it could occur a little bit earlier. I, I'm not I'm in a position to know that at this point in time. Any other questions? Thanks again, Chuck. Um, we have a couple more, two more people. Um, Joe Peterson.
Good afternoon, Canadian commissioners, U.S. commissioners, IPHC secretariat, and the members of the public today. Um, I'm here today, I'm gonna speak to you uh, briefly on uh, three separate items, uh, specifically within Alan's presentation um, that he just gave. And I have one, of, well, I guess one of my comments is a low hanging fruit for Alan to answer um, for the benefit of those in the room. Um, so my first comments um, are based um, upon the interplay between um, the multiple presentations um, that have been presented throughout this meeting. And the first topic I'd like to directly speak to uh, is analysis and effects of modeling size limits within the fishery um, and the 026 or retaining the 32 inch minimum size limit proposals. Um, so I noticed through both Alan's presentation and Ian's presentation for the first time that there's in fact a convergence between the 32 inch minimum size limit and age 10 fish, which uh, it was indicated um, that age 10 fish had finished distributing uh, as far as they were would throughout the stock. Uh, and so in my mind, um, that raised a red flag because now I can no longer hang my hat on whether it's the age of the fish that is causing the effects of migration to specific areas, or if it's the actual size of the fish and their habitat use um, for figuring out where that fish will go, when it will settle out um, at its specific time. Um, that um, also paired with the increasing size at age um, further, I guess would expand uh, my error bars as far as I'm looking at the um, analysis. Um, and so all of that um, coming into play um, really is making it hard for me to be able to support any sort of modification to size limit proposals for the commercial fisheries um, at this time. I don't think it is a bad idea to keep exploring the potential um, for changing um, size limits, uh, but at this point in time, um, specifically that the 2A tribes are not going to be able to support um, any size limit changes among all catch areas, um, especially because this question um, of migration and to what, what degree it will have impacts on stocks at the tail ends of the distribution, such as uh, 4B, 4CD, 4CD and E, 2A, um, that's really unknown. Um, and the drivers for migration really need to be known better before we start playing around um, with commercial fishery size limits and stuff like that uh, to increase yield. Um, further, another thought I had on that um, was as we see these yield curves, as we fish down on the potential males within the stock, um, because those are gonna be relatively in higher abundance now, um, you know, being below that 32 inch size limit. Um, the change in sex ratios as that fishery progresses is going to change from a new fishery that will encounter more males within the fishery to a more standard uh, fishery over time where it will get back to a different sex ratio as those males get thinned out of the fishery. Um, so um, with that, um, that concludes my uh, comments on the size ratios and stuff, and I can move on. Um, yes, I, I guess I would ask you, uh, though, um, Joe, to maybe get to your questions. Um, we have one more speaker, and, and so if you could pose your questions and then Alan could address them. Uh, yeah, so, so the question for Alan um, was within slide 12 of his presentation. Um, he had presented a population analysis um, and it was a proportional analysis and it was unclear if that was a proportion uh, based on number per unit effort or weight per unit effort within that slide. Over to you, Ellen. Thank you, Joe, for the question. I, I, is that the proportion, the 3.7% that I was referring to? It in was, that? Uh, it was uh, based on the uh, under 
32 inch fish that would have been accessed within the fishery. Okay, I don't recall exactly what that was. Um, but yeah, if, if I was presenting a, a proportion of anything, it would have been on the weight. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and so I guess, um, thank you. So my last general comment, if you wanted it, was a perspective on um, multi-year cycles for managing fisheries. Um, you know, through the Pacific Fishery Management Council process, uh, we do manage like ground fish species on a multi-year um, scale. Um, what that allows staff to do is you can take staff who is already spoken for hard dollar wise, you can retask them onto other projects that are important uh, to the benefit um, of the stock. And so although the hard dollar money is already spoken for, uh, it's not a direct cost saving, but it does provide a lot of analytical power and quantitative power for other analyses and projects that the staff would like to um, you know, pursue. Um, so I would like to see um, IPHC commissioners carefully consider, um, you know, multi-year um, stock assessments uh, with the caveat that everybody in this room uh, know um, that the science would continue to be collected uh, in off years of assessment. Thanks very much, Joe, for that perspective and sharing it with us. We have one more speaker, um, Forrest Braden. Sure. Um, I'll keep my comments uh, specific to the proposal on the three fish bag limit for Canada. And uh, I can see some consternation from the Canadian commissioners <laughs> on that. And uh, I th so I think that it uh, is deserved of explanation. Um, it seems like it boils down to whether marketing advantages uh, has any place in this conversation or not. I'm hearing from you that uh, our bag limits or size limits uh, may not align across the different areas and, and that rings true. Um, I'd like to clarify that what I'm hearing is that there is denial that the uh, purpose of this is to gain any marketing advantage and I believe that to be true and I, I didn't state my name for the record for Spraden Southeast Alaska Guides Organization. I apologize. Um, but I, I'd like you to maybe uh, think about the fact that uh, there could potentially be a marketing advantage and maybe you need to decide as commissioners whether that's an issue or not. Um, but currently Canada, I think, uh, allots 15% of the rec or the uh, TCY to the recreational fishery. It was currently or formerly 12%. That number is variable. Uh, if Canada saw that uh, it was more fortuitous for them to um, shift more allocation to the recreational fishery for whatever reason, possibly economical or economics based, uh, you could see that that eventually there, there could be a mark. Well, I'm gonna make a statement here. There is a marketing advantage to having different limits. I have clients that, uh, you know, check out the regulations uh, in Canada. They check out the regulations in South Central and they check out, out the regulations in Southeast. And to say that uh, people don't shop or um, there isn't, you know, a difference how people make choices, that, that would be untrue. Um, I don't know why we set a commercial fishery limits with a certain start or stop date, but I have heard that it is somewhat of a, a market-based discussion. Uh, if Canada, who seems more in favor of uh, fishing year-round because they can do it logistically with their rulemaking, uh, were to fish in those two months where, where the whole fishery is closed right now, perhaps they could get a higher market price. I don't know. Uh, you can respond to whether that's a consideration or not. But I, I'm going to maybe wrap this up in saying uh, we've had a two fish bag limit for recreational fisheries for since 1972, if I dug in the literature correctly. And that kind of sets the the borders. It sets the, the field, the, the game. And domestically, you can decide to reduce from there if you so choose, there's a lot of autonomy, how you pick, you know, your bag limits and your size limits, et cetera. But uh, if you exceed that, I think 
we really ought to, before we go down that road, we ought to dig at, at the origin of that two fish bag limit, what is really necessary for a recreational fishery. And if you have a start date that's late in the season, you're fulfilling everybody's sort of points here. Um, it's, it's, it can be a mop up fishery as it's been classified, a cleanup fishery. Um, it it kind of eases the uh, concerns for the US that it, it could potentially become a marketing discrepancy. And uh, I think you honestly have the tools that you could, I'm hearing a lot about monthly reviews and, and making these decisions. You're, you're meeting together often. You have to publish a change in uh, bag limits at some point. If, if you do change them, you could just as easily do that with size limits. You, we keep hearing from you that that's not possible, but it is possible. Um, maybe harder, but it is possible. So uh, we're just asking this commission to uh, look at it for what it's been put on the table for, and that's as a mop-up fishery, which should be, you should be satisfied with uh, a late season start date on that, with those, uh, that caveat. And uh, I, I'm hearing that it's 10%, um, that you've been within 10% prior to COVID. Uh, it seems to absorb that 10%, that, that should be a reasonable uh, way to look at it. So I'll conclude there, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Forrest. I mean, I think um, <clears throat> we also heard from uh, Chuck Parkin that um, I don't think categorizing it as a mop-up fishery is a appropriate dis um, distinction or word to use for what we're trying to do. We have uh, rules in place, as, and I won't go through them all, but um, there are a lot to ensure that the recreational fishery stays within its allotted 15% uh, of the TCEY that's allocated to uh, 2B. And um, we're looking for flexibility that will allow the recreational fishery to achieve that. Um, and to do it in an organized fashion, um, we spend a lot of time with the F SFAB to ensure that the, uh, to best of our ability, they won't go over. And as Chuck uh, identified, I think once in the last 11 years, that's come into play. I think our other part, part is, so um, what, all recreational or all fisheries should be um, having the same uh, regulations across all regulatory areas. It doesn't really seem to make sense to us. And also on the marketing aspect, um, it seems um, somewhat, um, arbitrary to me in some ways that that we should be considering that as one of the rationales for making changes to how we manage the fishery in BC. But thank you for sharing what your views are. Were there any, oh, just before you go for us, there might have been other questions or comments from other commissioners, I'm not sure. Um, Neil has one. So I, I think we're hearing pretty clearly the concerns about the sort of marketing advantage. And I wondered, you're, you're very experienced in this world. Um, do things like the presence or absence of a size limit matter to your clients? Um, does something like certainty around the length of the season matter to you as an operator? Uh, and how relevant would something like the presence or absence of an annual limit be. And it seems to me that those would also be factors that could influence people's choices about where they want to fish. Um, so I was curious on your thoughts about those as potential other factors that could shape people's choices. Thank you, through the chair, uh, Commissioner Davis. Uh, um, yeah, without question, uh, people's choices are governed by their desires. Uh, I mean, if halibut plays into a, a charter model or a recreational model, um, they're influenced by those those things. And I, I think my point is not necessarily that uh, those there shouldn't be autonomy to make those decisions across you know countries, contracting parties, regulatory areas. But um, I think if we get into the realm of uh, increasing the bag limit above a level that it's been set at and regulations have been built around for so many years that uh, it's a different discussion. And um, and I think that it needs to be, there needs to be a lot of thought about why has a two fish bag limit been set 
from the beginning. What are the needs of a recreational fishery? How much fish does a person need? Um, if we're asking for more fish as a country or a regulatory area, you know, in, to, to what end? And, uh, and how can that be used if we're, I get the cushion part and, and that seems to be why you originally wanted this. You had people not showing up and you had a bunch of fish left on the table. Um, but uh, I'm not, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think that uh, making the, making those decisions under that level is the same as increasing the bag limit above what it's been for 50 years. Any other questions or comments? No. Thanks very much for us for sharing your perspective. So I think that's the the last speaker. So um, we're gonna. There's nothing else on the agenda right now. We're gonna adjourn for lunch. Um, what time is it? Twelve thirty. We'll get back together at one thirty um, in this room again. Sorry, I might just quickly point out, so a reminder of the room arrangements. The Processor Advisory Board is going to meet downstairs in the Rattenbury Room at 1.30. The Conference Board will meet in this room at 2 o'clock. So there's a half, extra half hour there because we need to flip the room. And the Commission will meet downstairs uh, in the Bengal Room at 1.30. Thank you. <laughs>